Welcome. This is an addendum to uh, the series Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. Uh, recently, I released an episode on Jung as a prophet of the meaning crisis. I decided it would be a good idea to have uh, my good friend and colleague, uh, Anderson Todd. He's a former student of mine and now he's a colleague of mine. We work together. He's the uh, associate director of the Consciousness and Wisdom Studies Lab. Um, he has a degree in cognitive science. He's also uh, studied Jung extensively. Um, he's a practicing um, psychotherapist. So I thought it would be a very good idea to uh, bring Anderson in and uh, bring this into a more of a dialogue format and talk about Jung, uh, the meaning crisis, and uh, how that intersects uh, with other thinkers like Corbin and uh, current thinkers like Jordan Peterson. So, Anderson, welcome very much. Welcome. Well, thanks, John. I'm happy to be here. So, um, I came to Jung quite early. I think as many people do, I came to Jung sort of obliquely through sort of culture products. You know, he's, he's hidden on the cover of, uh, Sergeant Peppers, uh, in the background. So, you know, I kept encountering him, the music of the police, but I didn't have a very clear sense of it. Uh, and then I began to read Jung when I was 12 or 13. Um, and like things that I was reading around the time, I was reading Freud as well. Uh, and there is a, there's a big difference, you know, Freud is a very lucid yes. writer, right? And so, um, Although I, you know, disagreed with a great deal of what Freud wrote, and sort of the theory doesn't always hold up for me, although he's a giant, the theory doesn't always hold up for me. Nevertheless, it has yeah, that lucid yeah. quality, right? So reading it page by page, it's very compelling. And uh, reading Jung was not yeah. like that. Um, it was very difficult. Um, so I would sort of wade through it, and it would be like slogging through mud, and I would hit these long passages that were, you know, like written in Greek. And, uh, but nevertheless, every page or two, I would hit sort of a jewel, uh, and stumble on something like this that, that just sort of stopped me in my tracks, you know, a single sentence or a single paragraph that seemed to connect really, really deeply to my felt experience of things. And so Jung, um, came to have sort of a, a an increasingly central, um, role in the way that I was structuring thinking around psychology in my, in my kind of teenage years. And then I dropped it and, and came back to it as, as one does with these things and sort of went back and forth periodically making like a deeper and deeper slog into the collected works. And I worked as a full-time writer, um, for quite a few years as a, as a novelist and, and nonfiction. <clears throat> and it's sort of hard to avoid the archetypal, especially if you read people like Northrop Fry, right? If you're interested in critical theory, although Northrop Fry actually never credits Young, he did have Highly annotated copies of Jung in his no, library. No, I didn't know that. He never credits him. Never, uh, never. No. In fact, he he deliberately kind of rejects and slags on him. I mean, Jung was sort of persona non grata in the academy, and to some extent mm. still is, right? Um, so, you know, I was encountering these ideas more deeply and and giving thought to them. Um, and when I eventually came to university, uh, I had it in mind to eventually work towards being a psychotherapist, which is what I now do and had something of a depth psychological framework mm -hmm. in mind. So that kind of psychodynamic approach to thinking about people's, um, uh, to thinking about people's problems and the way that personality forms and development and so on and so forth was very central for me. But even then, I felt that there were pretty deep problems, um, with it. So some of those are reasonably well known. You know, uh, Jung died in the sixties. And so, you know, lots of his ideas, which may at one time have had some currency, you know, uh, really are in pretty bad need of updating. Uh, and, you know, in other areas, like every other thinker, he's at least 50% wrong. And that became sort of increasingly obvious to me. Where he gets things right, he, he's, it's striking, it's shocking. And he's a very talented phenomenologist, and I think he was a remarkably talented clinician in some ways. But also, you know, there are big gaps in his theory. There are pieces where he struggles to articulate things uh, and doesn't really have the scientific language at hand to do so. He does sort of the best he can with, you know, quantum mechanics uh, in places, and it doesn't quite work. Um, but then also, you know, the, the blind spots that just come about with the fact that, you know, he's contrary to what the Jungian community often, I think, treats it. He's not a saint. Um, you know, he's a man, and he's a human being, and one with, you know, his own fairly deep character flaws. So the desire to sort of supplement his work um, started to take on more and more importance to me. And then when I got to university, um, yeah, when I got to university, as it turns out, I already knew you, weirdly. So I had, I had audited your classes like back in the 90s because friends of mine who were enrolled at the school were doing a cognitive science degree and 
um, because I didn't realize yet that I wanted to be part of the academy. I just spent all of my time with students and in the library. Um, I ended up auditing a bunch of your classes. And I don't think you remember this. We had an argument about leprechauns um, <laughs> where I was being, I think, a bit of a, I think I was being a bit of a, like, intellectual saboteur. Mm. You were explaining something and I said, you know, something, we could explain that with leprechauns. And I remember you giving me, like, a really, I don't, are you serious look? I actually feel like that uh, sets a really good note um, <laughs> for things. Anyway, so, so yeah, so we had met then and had a few encounters. And so, when I first took your course on, I think, uh, Cognitive Science and Buddhism, I think mm. was the first course I took with you, that pretty rapidly got me to swing my major. Um, I had been doing an English major um, out of a simple desire to do something straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, and I pretty rapidly dropped that and did CogSci. And it was not long thereafter, I think, that you and I started to collaborate. So mm -hmm. um, collaborating on the work around consciousness. Um, and then I think soon thereafter was when we started talking about the lab yeah. and, and a few other projects. Uh, and of course, you you were a speaker right from the outset, uh, as were a few other people, Tony Toniato, um, uh, Dan Dolderman, Jordan Peterson, mm. um, were all speakers at the conference series that I started. Yeah, the Mind uh, Matters. Yeah, Mind Matters, which ran for six, six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so in that time, you know, we, you, you and I had sort of an increasing number of collaborations. But also, I had spent the better part of that period trying to sort of wrestle these different interests I had in the mind into some kind of working synthesis. Um, and I sensed that it was possible to do so, and that's still sort of an ongoing project. Um, and it's a tricky one, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the, the sort of driving ethos of cognitive science, um, you know, you would make the argument generally, and certainly here uh, at the University of Toronto, is this commitment to the naturalistic imperative. Yes. But I was once asked by somebody really early on, why, why Jung? Uh, Tony Toniato, actually. I, yeah, I right. sat and I was in his office and I said, why Freud, Tony? Like, why Freud? Why Freud? Um, I was quite puzzled. And he turned it around very ably on me and said, well, why Jung? And I was not prepared for that question. And so I sort of struggled through it. And what I came up with was more than any of the other of the depth psychologists and psychological theorists of the period and, and the psychodynamic sort of people, Jung takes seriously the realities of the soul. And by that, I don't mean, nor did Jung, you know, a kind of like a discarnate, you know, it's not a ghost living mm -hmm. in your body. That's not what we're talking about. But rather that Jung takes seriously and directly, you know, takes sort of reverentially the notion that spiritual reality and um, a sort of dimension of, of meaning, right, that is abstract and not easily grounded in physical things is not just relevant but central to sort of our, our human purpose and flourishing. Mm -hmm. And so because Jung took that so seriously, but also because I had um, you know, the sort of the naturalistic imperative at work, uh, you know, I had a lot of work ahead of me in terms of trying to square those things off Put them together. Right. Yeah. And figuring out like what, you know, what, what it means to, to have both of those commitments. Um, and like I said, that's far from, I think a fully solved problem, but as the, you know, the time went on, it's been almost a decade. Um, and I had theory from, from before, uh, it's become increasingly clear to me that actually these things play together far better. Um, than I think people might believe at first glance. Mm. Yeah. But would you, well, there's two things. I, I wanted to give you a chance. Uh, you were giving a very balanced overview of Jung, but you recently told me that uh, Jung's reputation has uh, gone through a bit of redemption. Maybe you could share that with people. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I was the last person to know this. So, uh, you know, I teach Jung uh, here uh, at the university. I, yes. I have the, the great pleasure to teach the uh, interdisciplinary courses in Jungian theory suite at New College. And, you know, it, as a Jung enthusiast, right, I'm often called upon to defend Jung. And the, the main thing that, of course, comes up routinely is, wasn't he a Nazi? Mm. Which, you know, that's a pretty serious charge. And, you know, there is a kind of an obvious split, right, in German intellectuals, right? That this is the Tillich-Heidegger split. Right. Heidegger signs up to the party. Tillich says no uh, and leaves. And Jung traditionally has fallen, I think, in public perception of this funny middle ground. Mm -hmm. And I know some people that really, really believe he was like a deep anti-Semite and so on and so forth. Now, that had never really washed with me. It just didn't make sense. It was clear that a lot of the Freudians had accused him of anti-Semitism. Mm 
Um, but they didn't like him for a lot of reasons. Right, right. right. Uh, and there was some fairly vicious exchanges um, in the psychodynamic community after the Jung Freud breakup. But then I found out, like a little under a year ago. So Jung, part of the problem was that Jung had stayed on in a kind of official capacity, somewhat answering. So when the Nazis took over, Jung decided to remain in charge of the, um, uh, you know, like of the psychoanalysis society. And obviously Freud being Jewish, that was, that was a no-go, yeah, right. but Jung stayed on. And the idea was that, mm, like maybe he sort of profited from that, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some questions that he might have been, you know, a sympathizer at the very least, like not sufficiently resistant. Right. Um, but in fact, I, I found out recently, um, that it's on record that Jung, in fact, worked for the OSS. Ah. So, so the OSS was the, the World War II precursor to the CIA. Yeah. Um, so it was sort of the, the intelligence, you know, the spy arm, basically, yeah. of, of the Allied forces. Uh, and Jung had an official, an official designation as Agent 488. He reported uh, through Alan Dulles' secretary to Alan Dulles, who became the first director of the CIA and was a quite significant World War II agent. And as it turns out, this stuff is all still classified, which itself is pretty weird. Um, but... Uh, he did psychological profiles of high ranking Nazi party members. Like he interacted with people and then I guess archetypally profiled their oh. like mythic landscape <laughs> or whatever. And Alan Dulles is on record as having said that, you know, people will never really know how much of a contribution Professor Young made to the winning of the war, which yeah. is, that's you know, impressive. Yeah, it's neat. So yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't a Nazi, he was a spy. <laughs> that's cool. That's kind of cool. Or something. He was a secret yeah. agent. Yeah. Yeah. Secret yeah. agent. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah. It's neat. Uh, so it's good to finally have an answer in that respect. But yeah. So uh, the reason uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you in more depth is, uh, well, as you know, I've do, you know my work. We do a lot of work together, and I've done this series, uh, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis, and I see Jung as a pivotal figure. Um, I group him with a bunch of other people I call the prophets of the meaning crisis. I'm using prophet in the Old Testament sense, not a fortune teller, but somebody who's speaking truths that uh, have a, like have a, that are like revelation. They, they need to, they're not being noticed. Something needs to be seen. Something needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, books like uh, Modern Man in Search of a Soul, and you mentioned the idea of a soul, seem to me to be clear documents, uh, portending and trying to craft a response to the meaning crisis. And so I thought maybe we could, talk a bit about that. Um, and then in connection with that, um, I'm sure that another person you encountered at U of T, especially with your interest in Jung, was Jordan Peterson, and your teaching courses on Jung, so I imagine that comes up. Um, and I, I, I think one of the reasons that uh, Jordan's work has, well, there's a couple of reasons. So one of the reasons why Jordan's work is so, uh, uh, has so much resonance, is so popular, I guess that's the right word, especially amongst uh, one group of people, the people that I'm in dialogue with, people like uh, Jonathan Pajot mm -hmm. and Paul Vanderclay, is that uh, Jordan seemed to have crafted an interpretation of Jung, similar in some ways to Joseph Campbell, but and then he seemed to have used that as a way of putting his finger on the pulse of the meaning crisis. So I thought maybe we could talk about sort of those two topics. We could talk about your take on Jung and the meaning crisis, perhaps your take on my take on Jung and the Meaning Crisis, and then how does Jordan Peterson's work fit into this, and what do you think about that in general? Because I'm sure you have to have thoughts about this, because you are teaching these courses um, about Jung uh, mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. at, at U of T. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, well, you know, looking at sort of profits of the Meaning Crisis, generally speaking, I thought you... It was interesting. As I was sort of watching you uh, build the diagram, um, <laughs> moving through, I was like, oh, wow. That's where this is going. And, uh, it was very, it was, it was very interesting sort of account. Like you drew some lines that were somewhat unexpected. And I might have, in fact, drawn some extra lines in there. Maybe I will. Um, in terms of Jung's role in that, you know, I think you do identify some really important threads, right? The, the influences that sort of go into Jung that, naturally form a part of the kind of meaning crisis account, right? So Kant is the ultra obvious mm -hmm. choice, right? You didn't mention Hegel, but like a lot of the approach to the Jungian synthesis of the opposites is essentially pulls from the, you know, Hegelian dialectic and the practice of dialectic. Um, Plato is yeah, a very yeah, obvious, yeah. A very blatantly obvious yeah. um, influence uh, on Jung. Um, Jung allegedly did not like Kierkegaard. Mm. Um, which 
Yeah, which might be interesting to touch on. But yeah, the, the big thrust, I think you're right, quite right, aside from his contemporaries, is, is Kant. Uh, and in fact, so much so that Jung, Jung referred to Kant as his philosopher. Mm -hmm. He, he was known in his medical residency to sort of bitch that he now only had time to read Kant on Sunday. Yeah. So, so, you know, there's no question that, um, you know, concepts, you know, the, the notion that we have sort of, categories, right, that structure our experience innately is very closely related to the Jungian notion of, of the archetype. Yeah, you, can get, you can get that sort of by taking the Jung's notion of the categories and Plato's notion of the forms and sort of... That's right, mashing them. Together. Mashing right. them. Yeah, I mean, Jung's concept of the archetype, and this is one of the problems when it comes to, to studying Jung. You know, I often field questions that are like, when, when Jung uses this term, what does he mean? Yeah, it's problematic. It's sure. deeply problematic because his work is occurring over a 50 year span and what he means changes. Mm -hmm. Now, for one thing, I think Jung as a thinker was less concerned with consistency than completeness to, to, you yeah, know, borrow the, the, the Gedalian uh, idea. So because of that, you know, there is a grab bag quality to his work. You know, you'll be going along and you'll be like, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, grail myth, good, mm -hmm. you know, parental issues, whatever, UFO is fine, right? That kind of thing happens fairly routinely where his desire to be inclusive in the way that his phenomenology functions means that sometimes the pieces are a little loose. But above and beyond that, his specific ideas about what terms mean shifts pretty considerably over the period. So just to take archetype as an example. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Sure. Okay, so what, like, I mean, I was, uh, I was impressed by Storr's idea that Jung has an organic model as mm -hmm. opposed to Freud's hydraulic model. Right. And so uh, I thought it was appropriate, I, I want to hear your feedback on this, to, to see Jung, I, I, I get that it's anachronistic, but nevertheless, maybe it's a way of, of, of properly appropriating his work, to see Jung in terms of like dynamical systems idea, a self-organizing system, and then you have attractor states within that self-organizing system, things like that. Right. And I was sort of pitching the architects along that line. So I, I, the model I had in mind is, like archetypes are like settings of a parameter on a state space as a dynamical, and the dynamical system moves through the state space and it has attractors. And those attractors are sort of the image or the content of the archetype, but they're not the archetype itself. itself. The archi right? Is, is that, is that, what would you think about that? Well, okay, so the the very nature of the archetype right off the bat, and you know, call back to Kant, is that you know the the thing in itself you can't get at. Yes. So the you know trying to describe the archetypes in any final sense is sort of doomed to failure. Um, and Jung offers a variety of explanations for that. Some of it is just like it's inaccessible because it is before the subjective and objective world, right? So you know the archetype exists sort of outside of the objective and subjective. It, it's part of the unus mundus, and therefore you can't get at it. That's mm -hmm. one possibility. But another possibility that he gives sometimes is like, well, it's just too big. It's too big for your ego to grapple. It's like you can't pull it in because there's, there's too much of it, and it's kind of a shapeshifter. Like I said, he moves around in this stuff. I think the attract, attractor state space and the idea of using dynamical systems theory to talk about it is an interesting lens. Like, it's, a, it's an interesting, and one that I share. Um, it maybe sanitizes a particular aspect, though, of Jung's focus on the psyche as a living system. Mm -hmm. So, I, obviously, right, like, if you treat organic living systems as dynamical systems... This Autopoetic is less, systems. Right, yeah, it's yeah. less of a problem. But there's something about talking about it in terms of state, space, and attractors that maybe doesn't quite capture. So the analogy that I use sometimes, okay, is like, in Freud's hydraulic system, we, you just have forces right? Pushing each other around. So if something is in your unconscious, if you have a repressed content, for instance, it's kind of like when you lose your keys in the couch, you go to check your pocket and they aren't there. Mm -hmm. And right. Uh, and where are your keys? And the thing is, if you pull all the couch cushions out, eventually you will find the keys, right? There they are. They're not right, going right. anywhere. Or you might like your phone, maybe where period your phone might go off and you'll be like, oh, it's in the couch. And nevertheless, it's static. It's sort of there. And in Jung, complexes and things don't have that form. Because they have that living reality, it's more like trying to catch a mouse behind your couch. So if you hear a mouse behind your couch and you pull the couch out, the mouse is gone, right? right? This is one of the sort of justifications for why you should do analysis in tandem with somebody, because they can wait at the other end of the couch to right, catch right, right, it right, right, when right. you pull the couch out, so to speak, right? So 
that idea, right, that it's a dynamical system, you know, if, if you can sort of extend that notion to really include the idea of the living system that's yeah, adjusting and has sure. its own goals, you certainly can. Yeah. But I think state space sometimes throws people off from that that right. dimension of it. So, like, if the system is is self organizing and it, it, it has the ability to sort of adapt to changing circumstances, kind of like what I talk about when I talk about parasitic processing, right. things like that. So, I would even go a little further. I would say that it's sort of maybe even explicit in Jung, but implicit in this particular take on Jung. It's not just that it's adaptive. And it's not just that it's flexible, and it's not even just that it's self-constituting. It is intentional. It has its own ideas about things mm -hmm. uh, and its own goals. And so that's sort of central in some sense to the psychodynamic model, right? The psychodynamic model at its heart, right, which precedes Freud and Jung considerably, right? Like really the perth based model goes back to the ancient Greeks at some level. Of course. But when we consider it in terms of the unconscious, you know, in the modern sense, the, the psychodynamic model is a rejection of the unitive bias. We all have this unitive bias that we sure. are singular unitive beings and that, you know, but in fact, we know from a raft of scientific evidence and from, you know, loads of anecdotal experience that people can share that in fact, what we are is a bunch of different forces or beings in a dynamic relationship to each other uh, that all happen to mostly answer to the same name. And live at the same address. So that really then, I mean, there's a sense then that uh, Freud's notion, notion of the soul then is going to be sort of deeply heretical, right? Because then it's not going to be the metaphysical locus of one's personal identity. If, if, if the way you're describing it, you've got sort of micro agencies at work. Uh, so what the, what does the soul then become in that model? Is there, I mean, there, if there so one way, one deep and ancient way of understanding the soul, uh, certainly uh, in long-standing tradi Christian tradition is, when I say John, what I'm deeply and most directly and ultimately pointing to is my soul. Your that, Atman. Yeah, well, or my soul in the Christian right. sense, I think. Yep. Uh, that's, yep. that's, that it, it's all about me that I identify with that is going to, that is seeking salvation and some kind of integrated. Sure. Uh, individual, non-divisible, yeah, individual, yeah. non-dividable, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, whereas that, that, if what you're saying is the case, then Jung does not have that model at all. No, I don't think he does. Mm. And uh, and I think that a lot of this, the, you know, the term individuation really screws with people. Ah, so let's share that, please. So individuation is like, I don't know, some people tend to tag this as sort of the Jungian enlightenment, and I'm not sure that that's quite accurate. But individuation is sort of the... <sighs> It's hard to say when, when Jung uses it, whether he means it to be descriptive or proscriptive. Is it a goal that one has or it's simply a description of what the mind does? But it's this like movement towards being who you are. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the idea that you are becoming more fully who you are over time. A lot of people take the term individuation to indicate that they are eventually going to become indivisible. Yeah. Right. That they'll become unitive and locked. But I don't think that's actually indicated at all. And, and sort of in looking at how that works and thinking about it sort of in those terms, it gets closer to what you mean. So, okay. So in the Jungian system, right, you have sort of, um, you know, multiple, multiple sort of loci of, of agency, right? So mm -hmm. you have your complexes, right, which are various forms. And then there are a few things like the, you know, the well-known, the ego, the shadow, right. the self, right? Uh, the persona. Um, when you're looking at the relationship between ego and self, particularly, the ego is the center of your conscious experience, and it's the center of your self-identification. And one way to look at sort of the process of individuation is that, you know, everything else that happens is just facilitating a particular change in the relationship between the ego and the self. Yeah, the dialogue. Yeah. One of the ways that I think... so. One of the ways that I think is useful to think about this, uh, or the metaphor that I teach often, is the shift from the geocentric to heliocentric thinking, okay? Mm -hmm. So imagine for a second that the ego is the Earth, okay? So of course the Earth thinks that it's the center of the universe, right? right, right That's right. the geocentric model. And it looks into the sky, and we see, we see the bodies in the heavens moving around, right? The sun rises and falls with a certain degree of regularity. The moon goes through its phases, whatever. And we see... The planets moving in this, frankly, kind of erratic way. And 
as we try to model that, right, we build orreries and systems of rotation. And in order to make the mathematics of this model of the system, we have to add increasing like epicycles, yeah, and, yeah. right? And elaborate this. And what's the big Copernican shift? The big Copernican shift, and this was not a new idea to Copernicus, right? It goes back to the Pythagoreans and the church knew about it. Yeah, Aristarchus. Right. Um, you know, the big move is uh, that, you know, we treat the sun as the center. And of course, Copernicus himself is very guarded yeah, about that in a way much. that Galileo yeah. isn't. Um, yeah. So we treat the sun as the center. And why do we do that? Because it makes the math easier. Similarly, right? If you are standing on ego and you look up and you think ego is the center of the system, then the movements of the other bodies in the system are highly erratic and difficult to predict. It makes no sense. Trying to relate everything back to ego means that things are confusing and weird, right? Mm -hmm. If instead you realize that the center of the system, right, is that thing up there, right? The self and the self and the sun you know, co co appear in the literature all the time, right? Uh, it's like, of course, God is the sun. You know, yeah. What else would it be? Um, so, you know, when when you suddenly treat the self as the center of the system and realize that everything, including your ego, is actually existing in a systematic relationship to that, suddenly the motions of your psyche become sort of more explicable, more predictable. When you realize that not everything that's going on in your psyche is serving you, the ego. Right. So what does that, what would that, a, a couple of questions. First yeah. of all, uh, the first question is, what does that look like phenomenologically? Uh, is it, it, you know, it sounds similar to me, uh, and I think people have pointed this out to aspects of Vedanta, mm -hmm. uh, the relationship between the ego and the Atman, mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, and, but what does that look like? And maybe that's part of the confusion with uh, enlightenment, because right. in Vedanta, that's clearly an aspect of enlightenment. And then secondly, um, the, the more I see what you're saying, and the more we're drawing out these connections, the more tortured the relationship between Jung and Christianity now seems to me. Very much. Yeah. Um, I mean, Jung, Jung is not a Christian. Right. Jung's a Gnostic. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, you know, it, yeah. Christian Gnostics, right? And, and likewise, you know, uh, you know, there were forms of Christianity that dipped into that, right? Like the Nestorians, mm -hmm. right? Had that kind of the divine double built into yeah, it. And yeah. We can get to that in a sec. So what's the relationship? Well, I mean, the thing is that... Well, first of all, what does it look like phenomenologically? Phenomenologically. And, so, then, and, then, the, and then we'll explore the more... The so that tells you about the relationship. I okay. mean, you know, the thing that's said is, and there are sort of intermediary stages, right? Generally speaking, within um, sort of Jungian individuation, you're not, you're not aiming to have a direct encounter with the self right away, right? Mm -hmm. there, so typically speaking, you're talking about doing shadow work first. That's called the apprentice piece, typically in the literature. Then you're doing work with uh, the anima animus, your contrasexual soul image, okay? And then eventually that segues through into the, the wider woolly menagerie of archetypal forces and beyond that, the self. So is what, the self also reaching, as you're reaching towards the self, is it reaching towards you? Because you describe these things as if they have at least kind of a, a para-intentionality or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so, so the, the self often gets described as the center and totality of the system. And that throws people, the center and totality. But I think that if you maintain the kind of solar system model, that makes no more sense, right? Well, that's what I was trying to use, the attractor statement. Right, idea. yeah, same kind of thing. So, yeah. so if you think of the sun, uh, you know, it's like, yes, it's the center and it's discrete, but also it's sine qua non. You yeah. take the sun out, there is no system. Yeah, Everything yeah. flies off in a space, right? So, and, and it is sort of, you know, out of an accretion disk or however much you want to push on this cosmological metaphor. You know, everything is sort of around that. What that looks like phenomenology, phenomenologically. So, so this is the thing, and this is where I think Jung ends up with a really interesting, interesting and distinct uh, approach to much of this spiritual material, is that the encounter with the self, this central organizing, meaning producing, right, the thing that is organizing all the other forces in the psyche as often as not shows up in terms of mystical and religious experience. That's mm -hmm. the phenomenology of it. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I talk about depth psychology, and I sort of tongue-in-cheek like to call it um, the theory and practice of things you'll have to deal with anyway. <laughs> yeah. Right? Because many of the aspects of Jungian depth psychology specifically are about having to take into account aspects of your own psyche, right, that you kind of can't get around, and denying them does you no good. 
So Jung has that position about uh, about you know the the divine, basically speaking, too, right? He says at the end of the day, epistemologically, like. What possible evidence could we get in one direction or another that would prove or disprove the existence of God? So this lines up with Hicks' argument about the spiritual ambiguity of the empirical evidence. That's right. Yeah, yeah very much. So I think, you know, in that sense, Jung is sort of a, an, an early important non-theist. I've tried to argue that, uh, yeah. that, that I think he's best understood as a non-theist. Yeah, I think so too, although his work gets cagier towards the end. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, he moves, like I said, the archetypes start being sort of the psychic equivalent of like a reflex, right? Like getting your, your uh, knee tapped and, yeah. right? So they start like that. And I think that there's some good material to think about them in those terms, um, which we can touch on. But eventually they become sort of cosmic principles. Like as he moves to explain them, they become more and more like Kantian categories, it, it, right? But like even more so, more yeah. maybe like the Platonic form. Well, I was going to say, it sounds like towards the end, what you're saying, I guess, he, he, I mean, at, you've read way more of Jung than I have, but I know there are several passages where he explicitly eschews metaphysics, and, and that's a Kantian thing. But from what you've been telling me, and what we've talked about this in the past, towards the end, he starts talking metaphysically yeah. again. Uh, and so it sounds like he maybe is reversing the Kantianism back towards a more Platonic model. Is that a fair thing to say? So actually, I think that what's happening is that in those late stage passages, he is attempting to reconcile the transjective. Ah. So, so okay, but I'll yeah. finish the other thing first and yeah, okay. come back. So, so his take on God is basically right. It's that. It's, it's that there is an absolute epistemological limit you cannot get yeah. the existence or non-existence of God, finally. But it's indisputable that people have these forces and encounters in their mind. And his basic point is, it's like, it doesn't matter at some level whether or not there's actually a God, because you do have to have an encounter with the part of yourself that is the meaning forming and the locus of the sacred. It's sort of the inexhaustible wellspring of your being. You have to have some encounter with that. If you don't, you end up often kind of deeply stunted in terms of your own potentials and mm -hmm. and what your you know what your life is and how you fit into it right and the thing is that he points out is he's like and this thing has certain ways of communicating and the ways that it wants to communicate are in symbolism and ritual so even though it may not be an actual divine principle in some ultimate metaphysical sense you have to deal with it like it is uh, so that would be an instance of where I talk about things being psychologically indispensable, but not metaphysically necessary. That's right. That's right. Okay. So that's fair. I can understand that. Um, now, so one criticism, and I've heard it from many people, I think Durley makes a criticism at one point. I think Buber is making a criticism mm -hmm. along these lines of, of, of Jung is this is all intrapsychic. Um, and therefore it's missing. Um, huge aspects, existential mode aspects yeah. that are central to the understanding of God. Now that that I'm 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 prompting you to return sure. back to the, yeah, the yeah. thing you wanted to make about the transjectivity. So so I mean I understand that critique. I just don't think it's the case. And yeah, so please. So the reason I don't think it's the case is is sort of a fewfold. Like one is, you know, we're used to talking about the imaginal, right? And mm. and you know the deep dialogue between um, Corbin and, and Jung. Jung at the the Aranos lectures. Would you? Um, can I just interrupt? Would you say it's important? And I, I was trying to make a case mm. that it's. It's, it's important to the understanding of Jung that the connection to Corbin be made more explicit and more developed scholastically? Yeah, I mean, as much as I gripe about people deriving ideas from Jung and not crediting him, Jung himself was not always particularly good about crediting sources of ideas. Right. Um, you know, he was a little bit self-mythologizing, I think, and consciously or unconsciously, hard to say. But like, you know, famously, he, essentially speaking, he and Freud stole work from Sabina Spielrein, yeah. right? She was the one who had come up with the concept of like the thanatoic death drive, and she had a lot of important contributions to early work, but no credit, right? So yeah, I mean, I see, I see Corbin nodding towards Jung, yes, but I don't so much see Jung referencing. So yeah, I I agree. Uh, I think that was an important relationship. The Aranos lectures, generally speaking, you know, as a set of sort of intellectual encounters between people that were doing that work in the period are, are remarkable. Did, did I ever lend you my copy of? No, you didn't. But you, sh I, you should. It's really good. Anyway. I, 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 yeah. I, so bringing it back, you're, you're going to go back into the imaginal and, and this, this critique of 
Jung as being merely intrapsychic. Right. So, okay. So when we talk about the imaginal and we talk about it in terms like active imagination, right? Mm. It's relatively, I think, easy for for people to to pull into the idea that what you're talking about is just a play of imagination. Yeah. yeah. But where that's less clear is in the discussion of dreams. Mm. Dreams as a form of the imaginal, right, because they're not sort of deliberate and occurring in an overlay on the conscious mind, are spontaneously produced, right, spontaneously produced imaginal material. And so they sort of more directly speak to this interface point between the experiencing self, right, and the sort of the the self which makes. Right, right, right. Um, And when you look at that material and the way that they talk about dream interpretation in particular, right? Like uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, who was one of Jung's sort of foremost, you know, disciples and to some extent popularizer, right? She she wrote very lucidly. And she often said about dreams that when you're dealing with a dream symbol, you know, somebody appears in your dream, your father appears in your dream, um, it's always pointing outwards and inwards. Mm -hmm. Always, Mm -hmm. always. And the thing, in fact, when you do dream interpretation, I noticed it when I was in analysis and I noticed it with my own clients, is that more often than not, people have the tendency to see dream material as pointing outwards, right? but not to pick up that it's pointing inwards. I see. And von Franz actually, I mean, I don't know how much of this emphasis was Jung's himself, but von Franz actually sort of said, like, really, you should count that as 20% outwards and 80% inwards. Mm. I'm not so sure about that. I actually think that a lot of Jung's later work around the, the psychoid, mm-hmm. right, which was this term that he had for something, right, that the archetype simultaneously reached into the material and the psychic worlds. And he was basically, I think, you know, he's trying to solve the mind-body problem at right. some level, <laughs> right? Uh, but he was doing it in this funny roundabout way because he was in dialogue with Wolfgang Pauli, and they thought maybe if they threw quantum mechanics oh, yeah. at it, they could crack it, right? Yeah. And I think they just didn't have the, yeah, they didn't just, have the tools. Yep. Yeah. But but the transjective is is very much a preoccupation for him. And mm. when you do specifically dream analysis, dream interpretation, that quality of pointing outwards and pointing inwards is is central. Holding both of those things in mind simultaneously is central to understanding what it is that's happening in a dream. So could 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 dream symbols and perhaps archetypes in general therefore afford something like sensibility transcendence, where you're getting where you're getting an insight that's both directed outward and inward at the same time, like John Wright talks about? Yes. Right. But but I think it's hard for people to do. Of course. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, most people, when they have that dream symbol, I mean, we, you know, lots of people have had, and we sort of, sort of smirk, right? It's like you're somebody you know, you know, your partner or something has a dream, and they're like, oh, I just had a dream, and you just did something terrible, and they're kind of mad at you. And you're like, what, <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do about that? I, right? Yeah. Okay. But... So, you know, that outward facing aspect of dreams, and then people will tend to sort of hand wave it, but people don't, naturally speaking, tend to gravitate towards what dreams are saying about themselves, right? The dreams are are less messages than they are sort of an immersion in the process of your psyche. A participatory knowing. A participatory knowing, right? I mean, you know, it's hard to grasp. I do this stuff pretty much full time and have done for a long time, but when I really sit with the idea It's like, so I have a dream, and in that dream, I'm talking to, you know, my friend, you know, Mm -hmm. and, but who am I interacting with? I'm not interacting with him. So who am I interacting with? I'm interacting with myself, like some portion of my mind, and yet I'm not consciously doing this, but some part of me is. And of course, we are now used to, in neuroscience and cognitive science, the idea that we are sort of conjuring the hallucination of the world around us out of scant data, right? Right. But it's very clear in a dream, especially like a lucid dream, yeah. where those interactions can be quite rich and they can be quite have a, a lot of phenomenological detail and depth. Yeah, I had one uh, not last night, but the night before. Really? Yeah. Um, it's been a while. I had one like a month ago. Mm. Uh, I keep meaning to get back into it, but that's I often do that in January. So, so I want to slow down here a little bit because yeah. I'm finding this really interesting. So, just because. Uh, like the Buber critique was, you know, you're not picking up on the existential modes, and you know, and, and Buber has something, you know, the I, thou, I, it, which is I argue is very analogous to Fromm's uh, having mode and being, being mode, mode, and yeah. these are existential modes, and they're inherently transjective. Yeah, they're they they're both processes by which you're assuming identities, participatory knowing, yeah. and I, I, I assigning identities, and there's a conformity relationship between them. They're they're co-determining, co-defining. Yeah, um, and so. Uh, 
I get the sense, and I and I, I see just to bring back Marie Louis Van France, I see alchemy as Ruyong describes it as inherently transjective yes. because you're you're doing this transformation of the psyche, and you're trying to get it to conform with the material world, and you're trying to get the two to get some sort of mutually afforded disclosure happening. Is that a fair interpretation? Yeah, partly, but partly it's also about using projection, right, right, as an innate capacity to externalize the contents of your psyche to a place where you can work on them without it being so personal. Right. So it's it's doing it's doing it's doing two things. Right. So what I'm trying to get at is the, the philosopher's stone is both an overcoming of deep patterns of self-deception, right, with the projection. Yeah. But it, 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 isn't it also giving me some access? I don't mean scientifically, but right, some access to you know patterns in reality that will help me make more better sense of the world. Yes. So, so to bring this back around to the geo- geocentric, heliocentric thing, right, right? Right. Okay. Good. When you have that sort of mystical divine encounter, such as it is with the self, right? One of the things Jung points out is that that experience, the encounter with the self, is always deeply humiliating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, He's mm-hmm. quite kind of keen on this. It is always humiliating. Now, to does he mean that? Because I've made a distinction in the series. There's two ways. There's our modern meaning where humiliation is a, is a pejorative thing. It's a bad thing. Right. And then there's humiliation in the original sense, which is the engendering, the creation of, of, a humility. State of humility. I think it's both. It's both. Okay. I think it's both. So I think when he means it, what he means is that it, it's a soul shattering experience. I mean, realizing that you are not the center of your own universe. Yeah. That it's not all about you. Right. I mean, that's fundamentally, that is the heart of the encounter between the ego and, and the self. It's not all about you. you. You have a role to play. The ego has a role to play. The conscious mind has a role to play. But you are not the only game in town, and you're not calling the shots. What I'm trying to get at yeah. um, is... But it produces that humility also. Right. No, no. And I get that. And I can see why that would be, if you'll allow me, epistemically and existentially valuable. Yeah. What I'm trying to get... I, uh, this uh, The question is getting clear in my mind. What's the relationship between gaining that humility towards the self, you're not the whole psychic show, and gaining that humility towards reality. So what's the relationship? Because there's a clear relationship in Vedanta sure. between uh, Atman is Brahman, right? right? So there's a, be, becoming more, uh, 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 I don't want to use the word, I'll use Atman because self-centered sounds ridiculously yeah, wrong. Yeah, in yeah. So what's the relationship become, be, between becoming Atman-centered rather than egocentric right. and becoming ontocentric rather than egocentric? Because in Vedanta, they're clearly allied as being mutually reinforcing, interpenetrating. Is that a fair thing to also see in Jung, or am I imposing on Jung? No, I think that's fair. So, but, but, so there isn't a logical identity. No, it's a non-logical identity. It's a non-logical identity, right? It's non-duality. It's, it's, it's kind of, yeah, but, but it, it's maybe, yeah, non-duality is closer. Because it's not, it's not the case that sort of self and ego are the same. Right. But nor is it the case that yeah. In some ways they they in some ways they are. I mean, right? Because ego is part of self and yet distinct from. Right. right? So there there is in the work of individuation a kind of simultaneous differentiation and integration. A complexification. A complexification. And this is the thing generally, when we're talking about individuation, you're talking about having an encounter that puts you into a state of um, metaphysical and epistemological humility relative to your own psyche and the forces inside of it. And the idea is that you want to develop different relationships with these parts of yourself. You want to get things moving in a system so that you can understand who and what you are without having to center everything on your ego need, right? Sure. But that means developing both a sense of identity with the system, but not direct identity. If you develop direct identity with the self, in the union system, that's bad. No, it's inflation. I, right? So I get that. So sorry, I'm not trying to trivialize. I yeah, think no, what no. you just said is important. So I, I get that you want the non-dual, right? Identity. That's why I think the term participation is a good term mm-hmm. between the ego and the self. What I'm trying to get at is in. So again, back to the the Buber critique, the existential mode, right? There's also a relation. What's the relationship between the self and reality? And and this is where the Kantian aspect right. always sort of trips me up when I try to get uh, to Jung. Uh, and that's why that's what I was saying, where there's a similar... In Vedanta, it's like, yes, the ego must realize it's non-dual at one mint with Atman, but then once it does that, that affords it in a participatory knowing the realization that Atman is Brahman, which is the, the ground of the psyche and the ground of the 
and the ground of being right. have a deeper. And this this was Buber's concern because Buber's concern he saw God as the ground of being, and he thought that Jung was reducing God to the ground of the psyche. So it sort of depends where you want to make your chalk mark on the fifty year line. Ah, please. So so the the further along you go, it seems to me, I think Jung always had sympathies towards those ideas, but he somewhat to manage the perception of him as a kooky mystic, and somewhat because he himself wanted to rein in his tendencies towards inflation, right? He starts out with a relatively grounded, sort of biologically, metaphorically driven mm-hmm. idea of what all this stuff is. So, you know, when when we're giving this opening idea that like, you know, uh, your your psychological encounters effectively structure your reality. And so you have to deal with it anyway, sure. right? And and it's as close as it comes in some ways, right? Even if you take a completely grounded, this is all just happening in your mind, it's still happening in your mind mm-hmm. and completely changing your mind and what's salient to you and what stands out to you and your experience of wonder in it. I mean, that's important. It's huge, totally, right? Totally. But it could all be contained within your head right. in the early part of Jung. As that goes on, he's trying to square it more and more. And some of this, I mean, gets into some of the, you know, for some people, zanier aspects of his work. If we're talking about something like synchronicity, mm-hmm. we are breaking straight out of A relatively, context, yeah. yeah, right? So, so synchronicity, I mean, lots of people are familiar with this term, but synchronicity is the idea of meaningful coincidence. And Jung had a longstanding interest in sort of parapsychological material, right? But also in these seemingly meaningful coincidences that he felt were not adequately explained by standard rational mm-hmm. sort of, you know, letting the air out. Part of his version of the miraculous. Yeah, very much. And as he, you know, went deeper and deeper on attempting to understand synchronicity, which he felt was a real thing that needed to be um, grappled with. And, and he has some predecessors. He was, he was somewhat familiar with the work of a uh, camera who had like the law of seriality, other people have been interested in sort of coincidences mm-hmm. as a thing that may actually be uh, not coincidental. Right, right, right. right? Uh, so as he goes deeper down the rabbit hole in terms of synchronicity, in terms of seemingly external manifestations of psychoid events, so he, he gets interested in UFOs, mm-hmm. and he starts to look at like UFO sightings and stuff as being, but also, you know, the appearances of the Virgin Mary in the sky, right, this right, kind of right. thing as being, well, what is that, right? What's happening? Because that doesn't seem to be strictly subjective. It seems that at the very least it's intersubjective or something when a whole right. group of people see that. Uh, and then he's increasingly interested in the idea that if indeed it is the case that his notion of of this stuff sort of bridges the mind-body gap, that it may stand outside of that altogether. And at that point, what we're dealing with is supernatural entities. No. That's and so that's the that's the difference. You start to get towards the end of Jung, and he's sort of I think he's just caved in, particularly after his heart attack. You know, he has a heart attack, near fatal heart attack, and after that, I think he's a full on he's a full on mystic. He believes that the things that he's talking about are part of the fundamental structure of the universe. Right, right, right. That, to me, uh, you know, I, I'm an aggressive militant agnostic about most, <laughs> about most things. Um, you know, so I believe in taking on a really strong degree of epistemological humility. I, I think that it's important to hold metaphysics lightly because we don't know. Like, we can have some degrees of plausibility and whatever, but like our, both our cultural and personal emphasis on certainty, um, this is something I might come back to if we're talking about this. It's, it's sort of out of control. And, and as tendency, like we have a tendency to shut off lines of possibility. So I keep a pretty broad, you know, state of mind, but a lot of the time that stuff is pretty gonzo even for me. Like my tendency is be like, is it really the case that the jester is a fundamental structure of reality? Like maybe. Maybe that's the case, right. but um, but it seems to me that probably there might be sort of easier to get to explanations that are a little bit more naturalistically grounded, but don't rob any of that of any of its like wonder or impact. Okay, well that's 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 a great segue. I mean, first of all, I, I, I you know that I'm trying to develop, uh, especially with Leo, uh, work on plausibility mm-hmm. as playing a central role, yeah. and that that's actually uh, much more important than the. the the rather quixotic pursuit, as you said, of certainty. Um, and, it, and it also tends to link knowledge uh, more clearly to wisdom, whereas the pursuit of certainty uh, keeps it keeps knowledge and wisdom separate from each other, because wisdom is often defined as 
where, how you behave in, in situations of significant uncertainty and things like that. Right. So uh, I, I'm in broad agreement with that. I, but the segue that came to mind, well, there, there's, I, I, there's some threads I want to keep, so I'll just announce them. I want to come back because now the, like, the, the Jung's non-theism and the relationship to Christianity is now getting even more tortured, um, in my mind yeah. uh, around this. And, uh, and that eventually I think has to bring us back to uh, talking about Jordan's work. Sure. But perhaps before I, I give you a chance to address that, I'd like to know what you think about, you know, um, well, the attempts I make, uh, for example, when you talk about aspects of the psyche that are deeper than the ego, sure. you know, I talk about uh, the pre-egoic nature of relevance realization mm -hmm. and how it's this recursive and, um, you know, uh, massively self-organizing thing and how it can uh, beset us with something that looked like dynamic versions of Jungian complexes, parasitic processing. Mm -hmm. So, like, what do you see there? Because I, I take it that that's been part of your project. Right. Yes. And so obviously, uh, for egocentric reasons, I'm interested in it. Sure, but sure. Also, for scientific reasons, I'm interested in it. What do you see about the relationship between Jung and relevance realization, to put it broadly? Okay. So I, I can maybe sort of work backwards. So, you know, you were talking about um, Jung to some extent and, and the relationship between Jung and Corbin and the divine double. Yeah. And the idea of having sort of a transjective symbol of the angel, right? Yeah. That's all in episode 48, 49, yeah. sort of and, in there. Yeah, because it's a. I'm influenced by Stang's idea that it's it's. Um, I, I hesitate. I don't want to use the word archetypal, but it's this. It's a. It's 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 an. It's a transjective uh, imaginal thing that keeps showing up, and right. that's the whole point of the book. And then I said, you, it's clear. It was, I saw it clear. It's clear in Corbin's. It's undeniable in Corbin, and it's. I think it's very clear in Tillich mm -hmm. uh, with the relationship as he puts it between the existential and the essential self. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. you know it's all through Gnosticism. Stang makes a very clear case. It's, it's, it's present in early forms of Christianity, Gnosticism, it's rife. And then because of Gnosticism, that led me to say, well, maybe plausibly it's, it's also in Jung. Right. I, I think it is. Um, I mean, you know, the, the notion of di divine doubling and a certain amount of like the assumption of the archetype moving, moving into the archetype is sort of relatively central to the, the on the ground practice of depth psychology and individuality. So what do you mean by that moving into the archetype? So, so there is a kind of like, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. So, so in Jung, we, you know, the idea of the persona, right? Yeah. You have the ego, the ego is your conscious mind in some sense. And it's, it's everything you seem to yourself. Separate from that is the interface that you have with the social world, right? So, right? And so the persona derived from the theatrical mask, right? And, and it's an interface insofar as it really is bi-directional. You both put things through it in a sense, right? It reveals and it conceals. Oh, but it also filters. But it also filters. So, so it contains your social role, right? You have to put on certain kinds of masks to do certain kinds of things. And you, we take this as a given, generally speaking, right? Like, you know, if you're a lawyer and you go to court, you have to have certain kinds of personality, television law notwithstanding. Mm. You have to have certain kinds of mm. persona in order to do it. Same thing goes for the academy, right? Yeah, being a professor. Totally. Or being a student. Right. By the time students get into undergrad, none of them are standing on their desk and screaming. Yeah. yeah. Or if they are, it's a highly anomalous event, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the ability to conform to the expectations and social roles and stuff is part of fitting in. It's both, right? But also, we push our individuality out. So, it's it's a bit like um, have you, uh, you know Sartor Resartus, Car Carlyle's book. So it's a book. Oh, like, I know Carlyle. Yeah, 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 about about the philosophy of clothes, right? It's it's a very funny, wry book. But one of the things that you get into this with persona is, you know, clothing reveals and it conceals, right? It has that that dual he yeah. Heideggerian kind of quality to it. It reveals and conceals. We say things about ourselves, but we also hide ourselves. Right. Okay. So, um, so. If, if we're sort of looking at, at that, right, we can, um, we can, I'm wondering if that's actually the best example now that I've started to get into it. Uh, moving into the archetype? Yeah. I'm wondering if I should be moving into the archetype or not. You want to take a break here? No, I'm just thinking about it for a second. Because um, if I start moving into persona specifically, no, I'm going to run into having to unpack all of that stuff. I think maybe, in fact, I should move back to talking about the divine double and self. Okay. Instead. Okay. Okay. So that's what I will do instead.
Um, okay, so there's a specific thing that you sort of unpack ar around that, right? Which is this idea that the divine double is standing in aspirationally. Yeah, I was trying to get. I was trying to link Jung's idea to Callard's idea of aspiration mm -hmm. because um, because it does it does a lot of work because Callard has a very powerful argument that this aspiration has to be part of what we mean by rationality. Mm -hmm. Yet she indicates, but does not develop a psychology around it, that it has to have this symbolic thing. It had, it, mentioning the persona was actually helpful, even though you're not going to go in it, because when you're aspiring, you need something that's Janus face like that. It has to, that's it, right. it has to draw you within the frame that you're in and the person that you are. But it also has to be beyond you that's right. and normatively challenging you to become the person you, you're aspiring to be. Okay. So we'll leave in all my stumbly processing. That's, that's the process of uncertainty. That's good. <laughs> uh, okay. So that, that's exactly what I was getting at is right. that when we move into persona, we start out by faking it until we make it. We don it, but persona can become too tight. It starts out typically being aspirational. So this is like the classic thing, right? Early undergrad, uh, you know, philosophy papers used to get slammed for using jargon and sort of yeah. awkward, right? They're yeah. awkward. Yeah. But the idea is they're trying on the form. And of course it's awkward because they're imperfectly emulating it. If they could perfectly emulate it, they'd already be doing it. Right, right. So they'd already know what they were doing, right? First we do it clumsily, then it's we do it. a serious play that I've been talking exactly, about. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so the persona is sort of an interface point for that, but it can come to fit too tightly. There is correspondingly a kind of inner, right? So the corresponding point to the, to the persona, which interfaces us with the world, the social world specifically, the anima or animus, right? The, the Oh, so it's the internal interface. That's right. Okay. Yeah, which is why, so, you know, he spent... I never knew that about the anima. I didn't quite understand it that way. That's very helpful. Yeah, so the, it's hard to understand, mm. but that's why it's the soul. And it's distinct from the self. This is one of the things that I wanted to point out with your ah. divine double thing. Oh, I see. So it, it has a psychopompic function. When you start interfacing with it... The, it so the anima is the soul. It's the interface between the ego and the self. That's right. And it's, it is the psychopomp. It's, yes. A psychopomp is something that leads you into. Right. Yeah. Into the afterlife or the underworld yeah. or between yeah. worlds or what have you. Yeah. So, so the contrasexual soul image, which I just for certain to soul, right. right? Is that is to the inner world what the persona is to the outer world. Oh, so that means they must have a strange relationship too. Well, they have a compensatory relationship. Uh, and so where the ego and the shadow, for instance, are compensatory to some extent, right? They, yeah. they It's an either or proposition, what's in each. To some extent that turns up in persona and soul. And that's one of the ways that, uh, that I and I think a fair number of other sort of neo-Jungians uh, try to look at this so that we don't get into so much gender essentialism right, around right. like the inner woman and the inner man. And like that right. stuff gets confusing given, you know, sort of more modern thinking on this, right? Sure. But if instead it's the case that all of your externally focused, you know, masculine traits, your ideas about what it is to be, you know, like I'm a man and this is how I present myself and whatever, the corresponding traits drift inwards and they become part of your inner relatedness. And because there tends to be sort of a, you know, statistical cultural clustering around this stuff, right? Um, whether or not it's sort of gender essential in the genetic sense, it is in a cultural sense. And so you'll tend to get right, right, those right. traits accumulating. Okay. That figure, that sort of soul figure, yeah. I think is closer to what you mean by the divine double. Double. And I mean, there are a few doubles. There are doubles and doubles and twins. It's, Jung is full of that kind of stuff. So the shadow has that quality too. So you're, what you're saying is, I was being, I, I, I agree with you now. I think your critique is excellent. Uh, because in fact, the what you've just done maps better onto the original use. So the divine double isn't ultimately the God beyond all possible right. gods. The divine double is the psychopompic right. figure it is never, but you do have a non-logical identity with yes. this. So Stang's point is that you're a individual, not an individual. Right. You're a individual, and that the relationship uh, with the divine double actually, right, draws you beyond. Now the thing is, uh, so I can, I, I think you're right, and I think I see. And there are other that. versions of this, right? Mercurius. Jung right. talks at great length about Mercurius, and Mercurius is a kind of version of this divine double that's even closer to the center of being. It partakes in all of the paradoxical, yeah, yeah. sort of mystical yeah, and, and, hermaphroditic, and you you see that in the Gnostics too. As, right. you, as you get, as, as you move, I, I, I want to say higher, but there's all metaphors yeah. through the divine double. So that's that's important because that do that to me then does strike me as 
perhaps maybe I got to go back and see what how Durley is playing with these two. But that seems like there's although I think they're both invoking the divine double. Jung's divine double is more closely Gnostic than Tillich's is. That's right. Uh, I mean, Tillich clearly has Gnosticism in him. He talks about the God beyond the God of theism and all of that. But the the divine double is. So yeah. I feel like Tillich draws on the Gnostics in order to. I mean, you know, the the mid twentieth century is like the high watermark for theology as the locus where we were going to perform some kind of cultural redemption. Yeah. And I don't think we're there anymore. No. I mean, I, now countless Catholics, uh, including some friends of mine, will disagree with me. But it seems to me like that's not really where this is going to happen. We're not going to get a modern theologian doing this. So, But Tillich clearly falls into that arc. Yeah. And it seems to me that he draws on the Gnostics. He's pulling things from them in order to yeah. run his project. But Jung was just a Gnostic. Yeah, yeah, he's just a Gnostic. He's just a Gnostic. Yeah. Jung got, you know, to an important extent, hammered with an experience, which he then attempted to sort out. So, so we, let's remember, I want you to eventually get back to how does this bridge between Jung and relevance realization? Sure. So, but also, I just want to put another pin. Given what you just said, and I mean, I, I, I was a little bit bold, but now you made me feel more confident in the boldness. I, I said that the formula for Jung is, is Kant plus Gnostics equals Jung. Um, With a sprinkling of Schopenhauer. Sprinkling it's like a sprinkling of Schopenhauer, of Schopenhauer. <laughs> yeah. Sprinkling of Schopenhauer. Fair enough. Uh, but given what you just said, and then given, of course, the very tortured relationship between Gnosticism and Christianity, this again makes the relationship between Jung and Christianity even more fraught. Sure. I mean, look, at, the, at its most basic, right, Jung has a lot of interest and respect in Christian symbolism, right? But as part of a broader subset, he doesn't identify Christian symbolism as being sort of unique unto itself, right? He sees it as part of a broader set of rebirth and resurrection and, oh, right? This is your point about him ultimately being a non-theist. Yeah, that's right. And But also that he, you know, he sees it as part of a tradition. So it's sort of the the flowering within our age of that tradition, right? The fish and so on and yeah. so forth, but really has lots of parallels and, and precedents, right? Um, but so this is very, this overlaps sort of interrupting yeah, yeah. because Durley, who, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he, 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 he uses Jung as a basis for making a critique of Christianity. Right. Well, so, so Jung does clearly have, okay, I can give you one example. Jung rejects out of hand the concept of privatio boni. Right, right, right. Throws it right out. So, right, so this is this is the Augustinian idea. Please go ahead. Sorry, yeah. So it's Augustine's idea that the the, the way to understand evil is not as having any metaphysical substance in and of itself, right. but rather it is merely the absence of good. Right, right. Privatio boni. And so the idea is there's just God, and then there are places that God, you know, I don't know, is not shining as brightly. I yeah. guess yeah. is the idea. And Jung throws that out. He is right off the bat like a dualist in this sense. He says, no, no, like you have to treat these things as having their own solidity and force and motion and purpose. Mm -hmm. No, the, well, de the devil him. needs his due. Yeah, you made this point at the very beginning. Right. right. So, I and, and mean, that's very central to Jungian thinking and something we'll actually come back to if, if we talk about sort of the shadow yeah. and the way that the, that the shadow works in this sense. So, you know, yeah, Jung immediately, and, and he has some other fairly deep critiques. If you read his, um, it's a thin little book. And it's a, it's a strange book. It's interesting, but it's strange, right? The answer to Job. Yeah, of course. Right? The answer to Job is, in many ways, Jung's attempt to synthesize together the meaning of Christianity together with sort of our current, you know, age and, and what that means. I mean, one of the things that you get in the deep Jung is the idea that the archetypes sort of aren't exactly totally outside of time and space because they evolve culturally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, where we might talk about like the axial age or something, Jung tags this stuff, you know, with sort of these 2000 year, right, right. you know, procession of the, yeah. right, whatever this is called, the cosmic seasons, right. no, cosmic months or something, something like that, like that whatever right. it's astrology. Right. So, so he identifies these like 2000 year long cycles. And one of the things that he says in the answer to Job, so right story of Job, you know, for, for, did you do Job in the series? No, I didn't. Okay. So the story of Job, right? It's, it's a late Old Testament, um, story. And what you have is God and the devil are sitting around on a mountainside. This is before they were like. God and Satan. Or, what did I say? The devil. Oh yeah. Okay. Satan, you're right. It was still a job description. Yeah. So God and the adversary, the angel that does the adversarial stuff are sitting on the side of a mountain and 
basically they get into an argument about whether or not uh, if sufficiently bad things happen to Job, God's faithful servant, Job will denounce him. And they take bets. You know, Satan's like, I bet you I can make his day sufficiently terrible, right? This is just like the bet in uh, The Dark Knight, right? Yeah. One, be- one bad day. Right, right. Uh, we're all one bad day. So, so they make this bet, and God's like, you're on. And then, with sort of God's go-ahead, he destroys Job's life, gives him disease, kills his children, ruins yeah. his fortune. And, you know, the, the original text uses this as an opportunity to really plumb some of our deepest sort of questions and concerns and anxieties around why do bad things happen yeah, to good it's, people. It's, it's, the problem, it's the problem of suffering and evil. Totally. Problem of suffering and evil. And then there's this final scene towards the end where... There's no answer, but God appears out of the world. Yeah, God. So, so Job is sitting around and talking to his buddies, and he's starting to get a little bit, you know, yeah. like, right? And then God suddenly appears from the whirlwind. And God delivers this speech, which um, is very interesting. It's like he basically questions Job's knowledge. He says, you have no idea what you're talking about. You know, canst thou draw Leviathan up with a hook? He brags about creating these giant monsters. And being able to defeat them. And being able to defeat them. Didst thou lay the foundations of the earth? Basically, God is like, you, fuck you, you, oh, well, I don't know if I can say that. Uh, you know, like, um, you, you just have no idea what you're talking about, you ignorant worm. I'm the creator of the universe. But, okay, I, I, I don't want to take too much steam out of, I mean, some people have interpreted that is that what God's doing is inducing a numinous experience. And, the, and, the, and, Part of the response yes. to the problem of evil is not a, any kind of philosophical proposition or argument, but it's like, look, here's the numinous. And you go, it's like, it's, right. like that, it's like that scene in Joe versus the volcano. You know, oh God, whose name I do I not know, thank you for my life, because he sees the numinous. Right, right, right. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't answer the fact that he believes he has some kind of brain cancer. It doesn't resolve any of his problems, but he becomes grateful for his life because of the encounter with the numinous, and that's the answer. Right. Be- beautiful and terrible like the sea, yeah, all who yeah. look on me shall love me and despair. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, for, for sure, it, I think that's one aspect. But the thing that Jung tags on specifically okay. is this particular exchange, because what Jung reads into this is this kind of encounter where it's like, Job basically did nothing to deserve this. Yes. And after the encounter, where Job does kind of knuckle under, God feels remorse. Ah. We have a kind of an Old Testament figure, because, you know, Old Testament God is a funny, capricious figure, right? You read Genesis. The, and Gnost- the Gnostics made a big deal exactly. of this. Exactly. And so yeah. this is a very Gnostic interpretation. Right. We have sort of old Nobo Daddy, right. right, who's throwing his weight around in the Bible, like, you think I'm just a hill god? Snakes for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, right? We have this Old Testament God that's hard to deal with, hard to reconcile, right? Hard to chew through. And this is part of the Gnostic problem. And in the Book of Job, Jung sees a moment where that God feels remorse. And that, for him, is the moment where it's necessary to then incarnate in the flesh so that you can suffer. He sees that as the transmission book into Christianity. Right. That's just heresy. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally <laughs> right? Totally. That is not a conventional <laughs> Orthodox Christian idea in any way. Right. So the it's idea deeply that. Deeply Gnostic, though. Very deeply Gnostic. So, yeah, no, I think Jung is. You know, whether or not he would have had the courage all along to say that he was a Gnostic, because he was already sort of plastered with a lot of labels as a weirdo. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether or not he would have had the courage, I mean, one of his earliest works around the period of the Red Book is The Seven Sermons. Yeah, I tried, I tried reading some of that. It's very hard. Well, it, you know, it reads like a Gnostic text. Yeah. yeah and yeah, trying does. to read the Gnostic Gospels is very tough, like, except for the Gospel of Truth or the Gospel of Thomas. Gospel, okay, the Gospel of Thomas is pretty good because it just, puts like a clarifying spin on the synoptic gospels. Mm. It's like nice little aphorisms, that's good. But like, you know, perfect thunder mind. A thunder perfect thunder mind. perfect mind. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, a bunch of those other ones where it's like constantly unfolding pleromas and multi-crowned monster dragons. Yeah, it, and it, it gets... It's visionary, right? And of course there are, I think, important imaginal things happening there. Yeah. Like the conics idea that you got you're getting right. you're getting a different interpretation of the sacred not as something that should be fixed, right. but as something that should be com- con- constantly transgressed. That's right. Which gets us back to the symbols. Yes. Right. Yeah, well, so the inexhaustibility and the transjectiveness. And yeah, when I read Seven Sermons of the Dead, that young book, I own it, and I've read it a bunch. What I see there is not something that's easy for me to directly connect to, but I can empathize with because I've had comparable experiences of poetry. 
I've had right. I've had right. automatic right. writing poetry things that that came through me or that was the felt sense right of course at some level I'm sure that biologically I produced it but that was not the felt sense the felt sense was that it was a thing that happened to and through me yeah. and that contained sort of massive right archetypal structure to it yeah there's a distinction that Tanabe talks about about self power and other power that's crucial to certain aspects of Buddhism. And right effort is about getting the balance between self-power and other power. Right. Um, so, I mean, you invoked transjectivity, you, you invoked, you know, inexhaustibility, you t- invoke salience. So I'll try to bring it back to again. Right. Like you keep, okay, so I'll give the, keep, I'll give the, I'll give you, you keep the, invoking the, yeah, the yeah, connections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm teasing you. I'll give you, I'll give you the simple, the simple. So this is how I think about it. I, I wouldn't want to put words in Jung's mouth necessarily, but this is how I think about it. I think about, so, you know, you talked, I think, in episode 32, your mm-hmm. series about Montague and mutual modeling, mm-hmm. okay? And I, I often think about it in those terms and in type, what we're talking about when we're talking about typology. But in the simplest sense, I think about it in this way. There are a series of encounters that I can have within my own mind, okay, with figures that compose my psyche but are not identical with the person I would call Anderson. But they're right. important parts of my functioning. Those include things like the internal mutual models I developed for my parents. Right, right, right. Who, you know, and this is a point that I sometimes make, it's like, well, that's an area where Freud was right, right? Theory of mind, we know that we have theory of mind for other people before we have it for ourselves. Yes. And under mutual modeling, we know that, evolutionarily speaking, it's yeah. absolutely crucial that you be able to internalize your parents. Yep. Often, in fact, you, your enormous frustration as a young adult. You get a lot of your metacognitive abilities through from, like Vygotsky, right? right? But, and what, what you put those two things together, and what that means is your parents have been living in your head longer than you have. Yes. Oh, that's a good way of putting it. That's very provocative. Right? right. I mean, that, and in that sense, like, for And the effect, right. attachment, right? Or romantic. Right. Thing. So that's Jeff McDonald's work and other people's work. Totally. Right? right. So, so, you know, you get that. You get general, general kind of concepts of type. And to talk about type, people get very, you know, worked up about it. But really, type is just category. Mm-hmm. You know, and category is essential to doing any kind of abstract thinking, manipulating things in classes. That's type. Mm-hmm. You know, the fact that I'm not interacting with every cat as a radical individual, but I have some basic idea of where a cat wants to be scratched and not be scratched. I might sometimes get surprised, <laughs> right, right. but for the most part, right, I form type. Likewise, we interact with type on a day-to-day basis all the time and recognize in other people, uh, even when we don't in ourselves, like right, when we say somebody has a romantic type, and that's recently been put on empirical footing. People really do yeah, have yeah. a romantic type, right? right? And to say that romantic type is intertwined with people's pathologies of attachment and romance would be understating it even, right? Can I- Interject. You just yeah, sure. sparked an insight into it. Sure. Okay. So if we have sort of categorical relationships, mm. is part of Jung getting us to not make a modal confusion and shift from a category, an I it with our inner life to an I thou? Yes. Ah. Ah. Yes. Ah. That's why it's about developing relationships. Ah. Right? So you come to a relationship. And this is why um, often I think people. You know, the archetypes aren't things we have exactly. No, no, no. Right? They're they're and sort of they're somewhat fundamental structures, but the but the the fundament of the structure is that they will form, not the specific contents. And we have to encounter those specific contents in order to know ourselves. And those specific contents are best encountered uh as people, sort of. Yeah. Not sort quite, of. but sort of. Yeah, vows, but not necessarily persons. Right. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I'm, I'm on the fence, personally, about whether these aspects of our mind possess that, possess their own subjectivity intrinsically, or whether it's the case that through the practices that we engage in, we allow them to draw on the machinery of subjectivity, whether we person them. Right. We sort of allow them to exact that machinery so we can right. enter into a more direct therapeutic relationship right with exactly something like that. right like so I'm, I'm on the fence i i sort of suspect just because of well we, the ideas we've talked about around consciousness and the structure yeah. of the brain and how those things are related i don't see any reason why the brain not only uh shouldn't be able to but almost certainly undoubtedly is supporting multiple consciousnesses yeah, at and there's once. evidence from lucid dreaming and yeah there's like evidence from lucid dreaming i mean it goes right back to split brain we, yeah, we've sort yeah. of known this for a long time, but we don't want to support them more than one. Yeah. Person. And, you know, unless you think that there's some magic number of brain cells that kicks off consciousness, it's like, 
I don't see any reason why certain kinds of structures and functional patterns can't have separate operating consciousnesses. Sure. And when you look at structural dissociation as a, as a field, it just becomes increasingly obvious, like this is happening, right? And RAS lab stuff, yep. right? Uh, yeah. Hypnosis, dissociation, we, we can get into that. But the point is, I don't know per se whether or not there are already multiple people running around in your head or there are multiple dynamics and forces and the best way for you to deal with them is to interact with them and turn them into people. Like a spirit of finesse. Yeah, spirit of finesse, but also like the kind of projective love that you use with children and the projective love God uses to turn us into people. Agape. That's great. I like that connection. Now, I'm sort of of seeing, so I'm just trying to bring you one more time around to the connection. I keep interrupting you too. The connection between uh, Jung and the the way you are connecting Jung and relevance realization. You you just did it again. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, we're circumambulating. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) To borrow the term. Yeah. From Plato, by the way. It comes originally from Plato. Right. Um, so, So, you know, there's this variety of encounters, but like I said, I think that you know, when we're talking about the divine double, for instance, okay, that is an aspect of encounter that you would have with yourself, with the shadow, with mm-hmm. Mercurius, with whatever. But then I think that there is a level below or beyond that, which is a kind of direct, um, transjective, analogical identity relationship with the machinery of your own cognition. Right, so the pre-egoic, pre-conceptual, right, relevance realization. Relevance realization. Right, and maybe something beyond that too. I don't know. Yeah, I, like I'm not totally sure how deep that can go, but at the very least, relevance realization. And I think that's actually probably the best take that I have on what it is to encounter the self. Mm. The self isn't any of these individual features. It's the thing that allows these individual features to come into existence and supports them to begin with. Right, right. I see that. That's that's very clearly put. And God wears many masks. Yeah, yeah. You you know, so to directly encounter it is nearly impossible. You encounter it through its manifestations. It's a shape changer. The closer you get to it, the more obvious that becomes. And that's why Mercurius is intrinsically sort of paradoxical and shape-changing and a trickster and is the son of God and the devil, as right. they say, and has all these other things, right? It sort of approaches non-duality, teases something that is beyond duality, right? Uh, and it, it sort of hovers on the very threshold of entering into that Unus Mundus state, which is the you know, the, the, the Urgrund, the thing that makes it all, right? And, right, right. and the, cent- the center of our own being as, as the, the beings that we are attempting to figure out in, in right. a Heideggerian sense, right? Um, that, I think, is probably the best. That's my best shot, anyway. No, that's, that's very helpful. That's very clear. So, as you know, I've tried to use the relevance realization machinery in, or I guess at times, a complicated way, but at least a complex way of trying to get a grip on the meaning crisis. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, actually. I was thinking about this in the way in, and I was thinking about the meaning crisis relative to Jung and the way that spiritual crisis in Jung is the entry point. And I thought, oh, if I can borrow the meaning crisis and borrow something from The Simpsons, in a Jungian sense, we're actually facing the meaning crisitunity. <laughs> right? Yeah, I see. You know, it's, it's the meaning Christatunity. Yes, everything is falling apart and terrible and on fire. And this is, that's the door. Right. That's interesting. So the reason I brought that up uh, is because um, I think Jung is a prophet of, uh, of the meaning crisis. And, and we've talked about, you know, um, part of what, part of how I see him in prophet is precisely his, his critique of the, the established religion is not doing a good enough job, sure. um, and that's 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 that's, that's I think a fair that's a pervasive theme uh, yeah. through Jung. I think, yeah. um, and that then lines up with, like I said, his relationship to religion and Christianity in particular is a much more distanced relationship. Um, so why I'm bringing that up is that that brings us up to the topic of the meaning crisis, yeah. Jung, and then of course Jordan Peterson sure. and his take on that and, and the, the reading ideas. of the Bible that he's done and. Like so, it's clear to me that uh, that Jordan has said um, many insightful things. I don't want to detract from that, but it's clear to me that one of the things he's doing, and and in this sense, he echoes Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell sort of was a big star for a while when, when I was growing up, sure. right? Uh, and he has the influence over the original I Star Wars. Just rewatched him with Bill Moyers yeah. on uh, it's on Netflix. The Power of Myth, right? yeah, Power yeah. of Myth. And, and the huge influence on the the, the original four, the original three movies, yes. right, of Star Wars, uh, 
Um, and because exactly that, he, he brings up Jung as a way of giving people access to symbolism and self-transcendence and self-transformation in response to the meaning crisis. And I see part of why Jordan skyrocketed. Part of it, of course, was a whole political thing that I don't want to get into. Mm -hmm. But part of it is he does something similar to Campbell, but he does it um, I, much more charismatically, yeah. I think. And he also has he, he has a much more powerful medium at his disposal, mm -hmm. uh, which is social media, YouTube, etc. Sure, sure. And so, um, in, in, and, and this is not, I'm not going to engage in any left-handed criticisms of Jordan. This is not to be dismissive, but I think that's part of the power of uh, of his why he he was uh, taken up by so many people is precisely the power that that is in Jung yes. as a response to the meaning crisis. Yeah, Jordan Jordan has his hand in contact with a current of mythic material mm -hmm. that people hunger for. Right, and. You know, the, yeah, that's powerful stuff. I mean, I can I talk about that by way of Star Wars because I think actually that's a really interesting sure. example. Uh, you know, as far as the meaning crisis goes, yeah, Jung, you know, Jung wrote a really interesting essay during the rise of Nazism or immediately before called Wotan, which I think is not as widely read as it should be, where he's talking about sort of this, this rise of a particular figure within the Germanic psyche and what mm. this is going to mean. And, but at the same time, he spends lots of time talking about how modernity is breaking down these old structures. He's a student of Nietzsche. Yeah. Yeah. He's not like unaware that oh, God yeah. is dead and we have killed yeah. him. And yeah. how can we get the blood off our hands? And what do we need to become to justify yeah. our crime? He knows all that. And in fact, in Ion, which is perhaps his most profoundly weird book, and I say that, you know, like pointedly, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you know, Ion is the second part of Collected Works, Volume 9. The first part is uh, uh, so relatively straightforward and has to do with sort of different um, archetypal structures and complexes. But the second part, Ion, is this really interesting wide-ranging book, and it's hard. And one of the things that he says in Ion, he gets into this, like, you know, cycles of history thing, and he says... You know, the faintest rudiments, we're on a 2000 year cycle. So the faintest, or thereabouts, so the faintest rudiments of the future society are actually visible now. He said, and I think that we'll transition to that society in about five or 600 years. I remember reading that and thinking, oh, right? <laughs> like, this isn't Age of Aquarius around the corner. No. This no. isn't I live to see it, probably. No. This is like, right, we're in the middle of a broad cultural movement. In the, in change and understanding on our relationship to the world. And really the scale that we need to look at is, is centuries, technological acceleration notwithstanding. I, I found that a really striking passage. And that's sort of Jung's take that we're going to go through this age of fire and despair. Um, and we're going to lose touch with lots of the formative myths, but that isn't necessarily bad either. Right. So, so breaking away from certain kinds of myths, right? Myths have a currency at a particular time, right? The thing that was sort of best fitted to human behavior in the pre-axial period yes. is not the same thing that's fitted to human behavior later. And to some extent, right, we, you know, we still see the rudiments of that. Like when we talk about Joseph Campbell and we talk about the hero's journey, I have to admit I'm deeply ambivalent about the hero's yeah. journey. And so please, is Young. Please. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, so Joseph Campbell, I think does, you know, he has the problem that lots of structuralists have right? That he's not really paying attention to the cultural specificity. Like right, he tends right. to oversynthesize, but that's not what's interesting about it to me. And, and this, you'll see, I think where this connects to the way that Jordan, I think connects to some of this stuff too. So Joseph Campbell does this thing. He, he creates the mono myth, yeah. right? The one guiding, you know, myth that you can, you know, use as the skeleton key to understand all of this stuff. Okay, fine. So George Lucas goes and reads the monomyth, and he expressly takes it and is like, I'm going to make a movie that's yeah. this combined with Flash Gordon. Right. I mean, that's what he does, right? So, you know, before that, George Lucas, you're going to get a bit of rant here. Before that, George Lucas had made like, you know, THX 1138 and American Graffiti, right? And American Graffiti made enough money that the studio said, George, we're going to give you 15 million bucks. Go make what you want. And he was like, terrific. I'm going to make this movie about skinny robots and hairy giants and space wizards. <laughs> and everybody looked at it and said, whatever, right? And the cast thought it was garbage and everybody thought it was ridiculous. But he explicitly took the kind of like incoherent mass of notes that he had and structured it according to Campbell. And what do we get coming out of the far side? We get the blockbuster. Yeah. 
And the blockbuster is like, that's a very modern phenomenon in a certain kind of way, right? The sure. idea that people would go to a movie theater and see something 12 times, that they would merchandise at that level and scale, the bed sheets, the lunch boxes. And I'm old enough that I remember the first wave of, of Star Wars coming sure. through, right? Since then, Disney has learned to operate the pump full time. But that first time through, like, it was a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And to say that it, you know, it's a structuring myth for people in my generation, I don't think it's an exaggeration. Sure. More people on the British census identify themselves as Jedi than Jewish. Yeah, Chris and Philip and I talk about that in the zombie yeah, book. Yeah, right? Okay. So he's doing something really specific when he taps into the hero's journey, and it's enormously resonant for people. You know, there's a sense that the older myths are kind of played out, right? People don't get the same kind of connection from them, but you take the same stuff and, and reclothe it. However, since then, Hollywood has done what Western culture does, right? The hero's journey as applied to Hollywood blockbusters is the same thing that we've done with fast food and cocaine. We take something that in its sort of like occasional and non-concentrated state is good for us and yeah, useful right, right. and instead turned it into something that's delightful to the degree of being poisonous. We mainline this same myth over and over and over and over again. And the problem with the hero's journey, in my opinion, okay, is that it's just one myth. It isn't the monomyth. Right. It isn't the sole myth that human beings tell or that's important to structuring your life. The sole thing isn't about a descent and a struggle against the great dragon. That isn't the only thing that's going on. And we know that even from Jung, because Jung, at a pivotal time after his break with Freud, has this dream where he kills Siegfried, right? Siegfried, the solar hero, he kills him, and he feels tremendous shame. But what he interprets that dream for himself, right, is like, oh, right, that part of my life, the solar hero part where I am questing to fight dragons, has to come to an end right. if I am going to develop wisdom. Right. Wisdom is not a high energy state where you slay dragons. Right, 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 right. Excellent. Right? And so we, we've sort of selectively chosen to pull some of this stuff, right? So that's a commodification and a trivialization totally. in an important way. Yeah, and also like a concentration. We've made these... Not these, in a good sense of the word. Not in a good sense. No, like a concentration, like, like I'm using cocaine advisedly. Right. You know, you chew a few leaves of cocaine, it helps you with your altitude sickness and it lets you march a little longer and it's generally pleasant. You take that and concentrate it to 50 or 100 times and it becomes addictive, compulsive, right. numbing, like all these things that maybe are not so good. So this is actually, you're, 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 this is a very maladaptive appropriation of Jung then in some ways. In some ways, I think. Uh, you know, and I, I don't think, I mean, and I don't want to get too much into corporate criticism here, but I, I don't think it's coincidental. Disney knows what they're doing. This is the having mode again. Right? Oh, sure. And look, Disney has been, you know, like buying up my childhood wholesale. They, they own it all, and they know what they're doing. Disney knows what they're doing. They understand this stuff. They've understood it for a long time, right? They, they understand how to make a myth tick, yeah. all right, in this way. But, of course, it's not in the service to, you know, at the end of the day, maybe we can look back fondly on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and say, wow, what a wonderful cultural document that really showed us da-da-da-da-da. But does anybody ultimately really believe that about Frozen 2? Is Frozen 2 being put out to, like, help yeah. us uh, appropriate our own self-development? So anyway. You've got a nice base here. So how does this now come back to, so you, that's an excellent critique of Campbell. Campbell in some ways, like he. He's great in some ways. He's great in some ways, but, but I, I, nobody's denying that. But yeah. you're making, a, I think, a very strong, but I think well-argued criticism that he's mal-shaping uh, Jung in, in, in a really, uh, you know, a really important way. Yes. Is that, are you saying the same thing about Jordan? To some extent, yes. I mean, you know, uh, so I have known and worked with Jordan nearly as long as I've known and worked with you. you know, yes. Early yes. contributor from Mind Matters. Um, you know, he and I had looked at doing some projects. We've eaten meals together. We're on a first name basis. Yeah. I've seen a lot of his talks. I know Jordan pretty well. Um, but his particular take on certain aspects of Jung is puzzling to me. Like, it's just, I'm not totally sure how to square it. So there are some aspects of Jordan's interpretation of Jung that I think are terrific and straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. So his emphasis on the importance and to some extent the reality, if not the actuality, of the mythic level of reality is, is yeah. really central and crucial, right? In that sense, Jordan nails it, right? He gets it. It's like, if you aren't paying attention to this 
level of analysis, you're missing something really, really important. And the fact that you kind of, that people want to point at it when they're being sort of brass tax realists and saying like, but what are we really talking about here? It's like, no, that doesn't matter. Hmm. Like you have to interact with this. Um, you know, you have to interact with it for the same reason that, you know, like an emotion can start a war. But what are, are emotions really real? It's like, yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Uh -huh. They're real, right? And these patterns are real. I mean, to give you just a quick example before I go on this, right? It's like at some level is the, you know, is the archetype of the mother, right? As part of the collective unconscious. Is that um, a fundamental feature of reality? Well, I don't know. But it's a fundamental feature of every human psyche because absolutely every human being had That's a mother. Yeah, yeah. And we all have some kind of relationship to them, even if it's a relationship of rejection or yeah. absence or, okay. right? And, you know, we've talked about with like ducks, goslings, right? You know, when they do imprinting with goslings, gosling hatches out of the egg. And whatever is there at that moment, pretty much, the gosling will imprint on and be disposed towards as though it was a mother. So if it's a mother goose, I said ducks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a mother goose and the gosling hatches, that's what, you know, nature expects in yeah. most conditions. But you could have a hand puppet or yeah. in some cases a ping pong ball. And the gosling will imprint on the ping pong ball in precisely the same way. The gosling's got a mother-shaped hole or a goose-shaped hole, right, in its mind, ready to be filled by whatever appears in the moment of imprinting. And then it will, you know, you roll the yeah. ball and the goslings will waddle afterwards. Similarly, we all have that structure, right? right? Okay. So we have to deal with these mythic realities, right? That I think Jordan does really ably. But there are other aspects of Jung where his interpretation strikes me as puzzling. Mm. So for instance, um, uh, when he talks about the shadow, right? You know, Jordan talks about the shadow quite a bit. And more often than not, he talks about the shadow sort of in its deep collective sense. And he references a kind of um, note that, that Jung made, which is like, to really encounter the depths of the collective shadow is a soul blasting experience, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about the shadow, the shadow is sort of everything that the ego rejects. It is all the potentials within oneself that we reject, that we throw away, they become othered. So technically, the shadow could be filled with lots of virtues if you're a particularly vicious person. Yes. And in fact, it's typically filled with virtues regardless. Right. So Jung often talks about the golden shadow. Right. The idea that when you were doing shadow work, which I mentioned is the apprentice piece, right? A lot of what you're doing is, yeah, partly that's about gaining a recognition of the ways in which you have been a bad person, yeah. right? bad things that you've done that you are, you know, people that you've hurt, bad things that you've done and you've kind of known it. But a lot of it is about just you know, going back and accessing the things that you left behind, right? You made decisions. You made decisions about who you were going to be. And sometimes you made those decisions because like, you know, your parents told you to do one thing rather than the other. Sometimes you did it to differentiate yourself from a sibling or a friend, right? I'm this kind of person, not that kind of person. So it might just be, uh, it might just be underdeveloped aspects of yourself then. Th that's exactly what it is. So, okay. so when we talk about shadow work, the golden shadow is pulling up these things that you left behind that are actually good. Because when you hit a certain stage in life, right, you might stagnate on the formulation that you have. And so where do you get that material? Well, you get it by reaching back, by reaching into the things you've thrown away. Oh, and there's difficulty because you've set up a, a, a structure of rejecting those things. Right. right. And, and not just that, but like typically speaking, to, you know, if you don't have some kind of conscious relationship with this part of yourself, and most people don't off the bat, we reject it. You tend to take that material and project it outside of yourself. I see. So, you know, we're all familiar with the term, like, love at first sight, right? Ah. But hate at first sight yeah. is a thing, too. Right. The thing that makes love at first sight operate is, like, we have an outsized reaction, a disproportionate degree of, oh, my God, I feel like I've known them forever. We wandered around. It's like we're soulmates. That's all love at first sight, right? Right, right. This feeling that there is some depth there that can't be there because we don't know them as people. But hate at first sight operates too, and it's deeply projective in the same way, right? We encounter somebody and we just, they just drive us crazy, right? We just hate their guts, even though we don't know them. Mm. That's projective shadow material. Shadow material can also show up as like incredible fear, fear of the other, right? So we, we reject and push away these things. It's sort of unthinkable. It's so far from us that it's unthinkable, right? Mm. And there's a rigidity to that 
you know, that if you have that othering, I mean, you, you get kind of two problems that turn up in the, in sort of the clinical aspect of this. One is you don't have access to that wealth of, of possibilities. Right. Right. So you can't reach back and pull aspects of yourself. You know, you used to draw as a kid. Oh, I don't know. I just lost track of that. It, it's very possible that to access sort of the green shoots in your psyche for your own development, mm. it's necessary to go and pull those things back. But why did you throw it away to begin with? You might have thrown it away because you got chastised. You need right. to grow up, you know, grow up and stop drawing. Like you need to focus on accounting right. or whatever. Right, 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 right. So that's part of the problem. The other part of the problem is the further away you push it, right, the more you dissociate yourself from that material, the more autonomous it becomes. And so the tendency is then for it to operate sort of on its own. It doesn't go away. It just does things and you don't notice. And you see this really clearly in people that are, I mean, dissociative, right? Yeah. Where they've rejected some aspect of themselves. And so as an example, um, I knew a, a good friend of mine was married to a fellow who was the first instance that I ever encountered of what I came to call Spock Buddhists. Right. So this was a guy who, who took up Buddhism and his explicit desire was to banish all emotions from himself, right, right, right. to become a perfectly, right? And this is one of these yeah. forms of spiritual bypassing, pretty yeah. common. So as a Spock Buddhist, this person believed that he had no more emotions. He believed this, Ooh. right? So you can guess exactly what this did. What it meant was that he had these incredible outbursts right. of sadness and rage, right. but he could never own them. No. It was never him and always you. Yes. This is a rational response to what you're doing. Yes. This, this isn't me experiencing an emotion. No. This is the, the rational fitted response to what you're doing. This is the problem with distancing yourself from your shadow. Okay. So doing shadow work is the apprentice piece because despite all the difficulty of really looking, taking a hard look in the mirror and, and acknowledging with sort of a deep humility and, and, you know, commitment to truth, the ways in which you are maybe not great. Yeah. Um, right. Which is part of the work. It's, it's also right there. It's easy to get at compared to some of this deep psychic stuff. Oh, so, so the stuff, the ways in which you've been sort of an asshole, yes. right, are more easily accessible than these, the, 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 the golden shadow. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? To some extent. I mean, the thing is that the ways in which you've been an asshole generally, you know, jump you at two in the morning anyway. Right, right. The trink, trick is just not to shrink away. Right. Right. We, we often, most people will experience some moments where we're like, oh, like I feel profoundly bad about myself. And, you know, there are a few things that we can do. Sometimes what we do is we sort of slurp the Kool-Aid of self-esteem and say, no, I'm perfect just as I am. And that's not good. Another thing that we do is we externalize that outside of ourselves. These are the people that become proponents of the one true way. And they're like, I'm never wrong. It's always the world. Everybody's an idiot. I, you know, right. These people who are always right about everything. And that's a horrible, inflexible place to be. Um, so I'm I'm trying to. So what you're doing is making an argument that the the shadow is a very complex thing, yeah, and our relationship to it is also very complex. Absolutely. And then you you crafted this argument, and I, I think it's a really good argument in response to my question about a criticism of Jordan. Jordan. So 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 one aspect though of shadow work, I've talked about shadow work, and I'm talking about it in very personal terms, right? right. But there is an aspect that Jung talks about where you're dealing with the shadow in the collective sense, and this is like encountering some of the fundamental, as it were, darkness that's part of the human experience. Right. For all that we are, you know, spiritual beings concerned with the aesthetic and love, we are also a genocidal species. Right. Capable of tremendous, right, producing tremendous suffering, cruelty. Like, this is an aspect of human experience too, right? Right, right. And one that really does need to be confronted with, right? It seems to me that a lot of the time when Jordan talks about the shadow, he talks about it with a very strong emphasis on that collective I see. sense, right? That you too could be a Nazi. Right. Right. right? right. And that's important. It's yeah. important to recognize that you could be a Nazi. But you don't want to stay there all the time. You want to pull your focus back to your personal shadow because that's where the work is. Right. 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 Um, so that's one thing. But for instance, okay, I saw a piece where somebody had asked Jordan how one develops their shadow, right? Um, and leaving aside that really properly in Jungian terms, one doesn't develop their shadow. It develops all on its own just fine. Right. You integrate it. 
Right, you right. have a series of encounters with it where you try to render it conscious and develop a relationship with it that specifically isn't rejectful. And so, so he lays through a set of practices, which are like, here is practically how you would go about doing shadow work. I was very interested in this. And so he says something basically like, you want to pay attention to the moments where you are experiencing resentment. And I was like, okay, fair, right? Negative, negative emotion is a good place to track. And then he moved from that to, and that may tell you when something is wrong in the world, and you want to stand up because it's an act of courage to oppose those things. Okay. Um, and, and then he sort of rounded this out by referencing a young quote that, um, to engage in sort of, uh, an act of radical honesty is, can be as effective in a certain sense, right? As, as doing psychoanalysis. And so the idea is that you track your own resentment, that tells you what's wrong with the world, and then you stand up, you speak truth against that thing. And that is a fine recipe, I think, for an encounter with your heroic self. Be courageous. Oppose things you think are evil. But that's not shadow work. Oh, I see. Right? It, the very nature of that, I mean, it can't be shadow work to identify something that you find like, activating and irksome in the world and then denounce it. That, that's the opposite of shadow work. <laughs> right, 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 right? Right, right, right. It's the opposite. In fact, what you want to do is track your resentment, figure out what it is in the world that's causing that, right? That's, that's triggering you, the hooks that are triggering you. And then use that to look within right. and to figure out like what, how am I involved in this? Why is it triggering for me? So I can give you an example. Okay. Uh, so this is an example that it's interesting. I teach with, and so it bounces off. When I took my first Jung course at U of T, I was in the class and there was this fellow in the class. And every time he spoke, I experienced this really strong, like antipathy. He drove me really crazy. Okay. Right. He would talk about things and I would find myself just simmering right, right, uh, right, at the right. other side of the room, thinking to myself, oh, this guy, like such a know-it-all, like big deal. Like, you know about this, you know, I know about all those things. Like, like he really made me mad. Right, right. So much so that I used to come home from that class and gripe to my housemates. I'd be like, that guy was talking again. Yeah. And like, it really made me nuts. But I was in a class on Jungian psychology, so I was also like, hmm, it seems like this might be a shadow projection, <laughs> right, right, right. right? You know, it seems like this might be a shadow projection. So instead, what I did was I approached him at the end, sort of at the end of class, and I said, hi, you know, I'm, I'm Anderson. Do you want to go get a beer? This person is one of my best friends now. Mm. And one of the reasons was all of the things that I was reacting to in him are things I don't like about myself, mm, mm -hmm. right? It's like, I, you know, I have no illusions that I both can come off and self-identify as kind of a know-it-all in a motor mouth, right? And so to the extent that that's a shadowy trait for me, projecting it outside and then having this like irrational, right, mm -hmm. feeling, that tells you more about shadow work. The same goes for the aspects of yourself. Just because it appears monstrous doesn't mean that it is monstrous if you approach it with sort of a, you know, a stance of charity. Mm. You know, you can think about this with like the therapeutic work that people use with nightmares and lucid dreams, right? Mm -hmm. Kid is having a nightmare where they're being, you know, chased by a troll or something. The idea is for them to become sufficiently lucid that they turn around and approach. And turning around and making the approach often within this stuff, right? The, the monster will cease to be monstrous. It will transform and then you can actually talk to it. What do you want? Yes, yes. Oh, I was just trying to get your attention. Yeah, I've had that experience. Right. I mean, this is a standard trope that you see in dreams. If aspects of your mind can't get your attention, they turn the dial up. And the main dial that they have access to is horror. Right. Right? right. So they keep turning it up until you start having nightmares and you pay attention. Right? But if you, in fact, make the approach yourself, right? And we know generally within psychotherapy, making the approach to an object of fear is different than the object of the fear Coming to you. Yeah, of course. You get pounced on from the bushes, that's one thing. You walk into the cave, it's something else. Yeah, yeah. So the idea is to make the approach towards the object of your fear and hatred and to try to charitably reframe to see how you can form some relationship with it and make it not so bad, right? It's, there's an aspect shift involved. So, you know, that's, that's sort of one example where, you know, the, the sort of recipe that Jordan gave on doing shadow work is an interesting recipe from the perspective of accessing one's heroic, you know, like, you know, mythological uh, 
you know, um, nature in some sense. But you've also emphasized we can, we can overemphasize that too. Right. And I think that that too is, you know, something that's maybe a bit problematic. It's not that I don't think that having a of warrior ethos can't be a valuable part of self-development, but it's not the only game in town. Yeah. And so, you know, similarly, sometimes I, I, you know, Jordan, for instance, will talk about order and chaos in the Tao. But then he has a relatively sort of strident, proactive, and externally focused approach to this that doesn't strike me as particularly Taoist at all, mm -hmm. right? Have courage, act, do stuff. Yeah, there's, not, there's a lot of yang, but not very much yin. Right, exactly. So to me, th both of those things are sort of indicative of a, a somewhat selective or, you know, I, it's his, his interpretation, right? It could be just as good as mine, and it's possible that he has good supports for it, but it's hard to square in some sense how he deploys that term. I, I, I don't think Jordan would want to, nor should his work be set up as something that's beyond criticism. If no. it's taken that way, then for me, if people are reacting to it that way, then for me, it loses any and all intellectual respectability. If people are simply putting it beyond the pale of criticism, then that for me has exactly the opposite effect. It's like, oh, well, then I'm not going to take it seriously. Right. Why should I? Right. Um, this brings me to, this brings me to. And oh, actually, sorry, I just want to say oh. in that respect, I mean, you know, I've, as I said, I've talked to Jordan a lot. And one of the things is, I mean, of course, he produces so many lectures, so much material, so many classes, right? He does tend to orbit themes, but also the sheer amount of stuff that he says means that necessarily maybe there are certain things that don't. Yeah, right. Th that's true. You but know? but but on but on the other hand, that's also something worthy of criticism because if you're going to overwhelm people with a large mass, you have to do a lot of work to render it systematically coherent so that people do have critical access to your work. Right. So, uh, I, I wanted to segue into something. Yeah. Uh, so that criticism you made, um, because as you notice, I sort of have a, a criticism, whereas Jordan seems, I, again, there's the mass of the work and I have to be careful, but I've seen a lot too, sure. like you. Yeah. Um, and many people are taking it this way that Jung, Jordan seems to ally Jung with theism and particularly with Christian theism in a way that for many reasons that we covered in our discussion seems to be me deeply mistaken. I think you can make a much stronger case that Jung is a non-theist, and I think you can make a much stronger case that he's a Gnostic and he's not a Christian, and he's in fact deeply critical at a fundamental level of what what many people would call Christianity. Yeah, so I mean, I've tried to sort of square that off too, and partly as part of an effort to figure out in what sense Jordan's a Christian. Uh, that's a tortured question. It is a tortured question, but but I think that maybe there's something useful in there. Okay, like to the extent that he is drawing on Jung as being like a, a central source, it's like, okay, so what are we saying here? We're saying that the myths of incarnation and sacrifice and resurrection are still relevant, right? Sure. And I think that's true. Yes, yes. I think that those things are all true. Right. And I think that, you know, yes, it's also true that you, you don't want to sort of, um, you don't want to just throw out the whole mythical apparatus of your culture. No, right. Like no, there's just yeah. too much there. And, and in the West, we have done that somewhat. You know, a, 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 um, a critique that I had many years ago when we were talking about Buddhism was, I think far too many people in, in the West have sort of sought the exoticism of right Eastern systems rather than bother right, going right. back to sort of try to recapture yeah, some of that I, stuff. And, and I understand why, yeah. but right. So I think if, if we take that level and just say, yeah, yeah, Christianity still has some useful to borrow our language, right? Some useful it's psychotechnologies. Sort of yes. Right. So, you know, in that sense, yeah, I agree with you. Like, yeah. Jung's not a Christian, not in that sense, no. not in any kind of traditional conservative sense. He had extremely like unorthodox, bordering on heretical mm -hmm. and Gnostic views. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't think that that material can't be used to create a kind of regenerate approach, of course, of course, right? Of course, of course. And I think, you know, Tillich, right? There's a reason Tillich gets accused to some extent of the same thing. There are yes, lots of he's, people. He's often. Uh, called a heretic. Yes. Right, right. Because it's like in some sense, well, what he's talking about, this doesn't seem to be 
our traditional Sunday school material. That's why I think it's important to read Tillich the way Durley does with Jung, because Tillich shows you somebody who more explicitly tries to get this uh, interacting with Christianity and what a tough, tough job it is. Yes. And how much a Christian, again, he bends Christianity explicitly to non-theism. Right. Right. Um, and so uh, that's, yeah, I, 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 that's, that, that was an argument I wanted to make. Was there any other point you wanted to bring up? I mean, there's, uh, there's also stuff I've heard you mention about sort of the treatment of symbols that it seems to uh, be implied about what you've been saying here. Yeah. I mean, you know, so there are a couple of angles here. Um, so, so yeah, one is that I, periodically I find, and I, I think maybe that Jordan himself doesn't think this, like I think it's a, it's an outgrowth of rhetoric or something, but periodically there is a way that he approaches symbolic interpretation um, where his language isn't tentative enough. Yeah, so you see this sometimes in the biblical series where he says this is the interpretation. This is the interpretation of X, Y, Z. And I mean, you know, there are versions of this. I mean, I think at this point, anybody that's watched his material has seen, you know, his unpacking of, say, the Garden of Eden. Right. Which sort of mingles together some speculative evolutionary ideas about the development of color vision, snake patterning, yeah. fruit, um, and a few other things right into sort of a general, this is sort of a routine. Yeah. I mean, he's been, you know, he's been teaching that routine. It's part of, and I'm an instructor too. I understand what it's like to have certain kinds yeah, of routines. Yeah, you need them. You need them. Um, so it's a routine that he's been running since Harvard. You can go back and watch him deliver some version of that talk in the nineties. And the problem with it is that because it's insufficiently tentative, people that don't have maybe the same depth of experience in treating symbols as being multi-aspectual and inexhaustible have a tendency to treat that as a settled interpretation. Yes. And central to the notion of the symbol, I mean, that's what distinguishes a symbol from a sign. Yes, exactly. A sign means a thing, and yeah. a symbol means a lot of things. Like, yeah. and, and sort of is endlessly disclosing. That is the whole point of it. That is why it's sacred. That's why it's useful. Yes. yes. Right? Um, and and maybe even more than that, like, you know, the, the, the fact that the symbol can endlessly disclose in this way is part of what structures a bunch of other things in depth psychology. Like, there's a reason that you can't have a book that's called 10,000 Dreams Interpreted that's serious, because people always want that. They're like, yeah. I saw a raven in my dream. What does it mean? <laughs> and the answer is like, well, that depends. Right. It's like you take into account cultural levels. You take into account your personal history. You take into account your other dreams. Dreams yeah. are never interpreted in isolation. They're always interpreted as part of, because right, there is right. a language that develops. And, you know, in keeping with this, like, you know, it's possible that you are allowing these parts of your psyche to plug into certain kinds of machinery. You develop a relationship when you're doing this kind of work. Right where, yeah, you get better and better at accessing deep layers of yourself, but also those layers yeah, start to express things yeah. well, in certain ways. I've like I've been keeping a dream journal for years, right? And I I went through Jungian therapy and yeah. did lots of uh, uh, of coursework and seminars and stuff, and I, I noticed that too. You get that that there's a dialogic feel that totally. comes, comes out of it. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's an exchange back and forth. And in some cases, like, you know, really, it's funny because when I was thinking about the, the divine double and the um, aspirational self, it's like a known quantity with uh, sort of analysts and therapists that soon after you enter analysis, you will often have your first analyst dream right, dream. where you, you right? Yeah. And that is often a really important right. dream to pay attention to because it's pointing towards some future state of self. Right, it's like right. this, is the, this is the kernel of what you're developing. Anyway. So uh, sometimes I think that the the sort of not taking a sufficiently tentative line on some of the stuff means that the the rhetoric of of absolute interpretation enters in. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, and I, I see that's to me where I, I, I don't I don't know about well if if you take the symbol as continually disclosing th yeah. that's much more gnostic, right? Yes, yes. Whereas if you say this is the this is this is how the t symbol is interpreted. That's ultimately just a is, is just a two stage literalism. Yes, right. Which is which is I think deeply and antithetical to Jung's approach to the symbol. Right. And so I actually think that that is to some extent symptomatic of uh, of the other trend that I sometimes see um, in Jordan's work, or at least in the sort of popular approach to it, um, which is the the fetishization of certainty. Yes. yes. Right. 
So, you know, there is a kind of line that, that runs through. I think I first encountered this when Jordan delivered a talk called The Necessity of Virtue, mm -hmm. which I saw a number of years ago. And it's interesting. I, I had the opportunity to sort of have coffee and talk to him at length after that talk where he had referenced fairly heavily Dostoevsky. And I ended up having a conversation with him where I was like, okay, yes, all this stuff about virtue and good and evil and the knowledge of good and evil. But Dostoevsky also said, beauty will save the world. Yes. And what does that mean? Like, how do you plug that into what you're saying about truth and good? Because that's the third one of the triad and maybe the one that rescues us because it's so much less fraught. It's less of a battleground, right? And actually, he had, to be honest, in person, a far more accommodating, mm -hmm. right? Than, yeah, I've than, that with Jordan, too. Yeah, yes. his presentation at the time. That was, I think, maybe the first conversation I ever had with him. So, but, but there is this approach to certainty. And I mean, it goes something like this, right? It goes, you know what to do. At some level, you know what to do. And you can tell when you know what to do when you do what you know. No. <laughs> you do what you knew that you had to do, right? right? Because you feel a kind of alignment. And that's an interesting idea and a seductive one. Yeah, I don't like that idea, as you know. I, I just don't think it's true. Well, that's why I don't like it. I think it's a dec I, I attribute that to a kind of decadent romanticism. So that's, that's part of the problem. I mean, I sort of run this idea through and I think to myself, well, I don't know what to do all of the time. And, 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 and Socrates sometimes didn't. Didn't know uh, what to do. <laughs> and it seems to me that a great number of people, certainly in my practice, either don't know what to do or are experiencing intense ambivalence about what to do. It can be almost as horrible to choose between two goods as two evils. Sure. Right? And so, you know, I think about this and I, I assume somewhere in your series you talked about like the way of the wanton and, and hyperbolic yes. discounting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think about this sometimes in that term. I think, okay, what is the most clarifying life event that people often tag onto? And one of the ones that you see come up in clinical practice is a brush with death. People will pray for a brush with death when they feel confused because it will clarify their priorities, right? If I can, if I can just get... Really? Uh, yep. Yeah. People are just like, I just want to get hit by a bus and be put in a body cast for six weeks so that I will know what's really important. That's a thing people say. So, okay, interesting. So I think about that and I'm like, okay, a brush with death. We take that culturally as being one of the most clarifying things that we can have happen, right? But there are two responses that you can have to a brush with death and they, they're equally credible. One is you can say, geez, like I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Life is short. I need to stop focusing on endless deferral. I need to focus on the now, you know, YOLO. Like I need to live my life. And yeah. start focusing on, right? That's one response. And we look at that and we say, yep, that sounds, that sounds very plausible yeah. to me. And then the other response is, crap, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow. I really got to buckle down. I got to start thinking about the long term. Yeah. I got to stop frittering away my Life, time in this day-to-day -day way and really start considering legacy. And we think, uh-huh. And so what is it that resolves that within the, the brush with death? Where does certainty arrive? I don't know. The brush with death is supposed to provide it, allegedly, but I don't believe that it does. But this is this is this is one of the central points in Tillich, right? Right. The existential tonus. We we most of our life is we we are facing things that are are in irresolvable tension with each other. Of course, I like that because it maps onto the sure. relevance realization machinery. But independent of my particular thing, I think that's a profound point that Tillich makes. That you know that 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 you know there is no you know. I need to be myself. No, no, I need to belong to a group. No, no, I right. need to be right, myself. Right, right, no, right. I need, and there, there is no, there is there's no, no fi there's no final answer. And, and, it, it, and that means literally there is no certainty about it. That's right. Be. That's right. So, so I, you know, and I, like you, uh, probably because of you, at least in part, you know, I, I share that. Like lots of things are like evolution. There isn't a final form. Being a shark does not solve every problem. Yeah. Sharks in the desert buy it. Yeah. They're the <laughs> ultimate predator in the, in the trench, but out in the desert, they're toast. Tigers do well in the jungle. They do less well in the ice caps. Yeah. There is no final answer. Yeah. Everything is about functional fit. And it's the same with the kinds of like ontological strategies yeah, and existential choices. existential choices we make, right? So if that's the case, right, then you know what to do. It's like, no, I don't think I do. And I don't think other people do either. And I think the sooner we, we 
move away from the idea that we have a certainty that somehow we're morally failing to access, the sooner we can deal with the idea that we are fallible, but that doesn't let us off the hook. No, no, no. It, it, in it, fact, it, demands that we interact with... No, what I see you criticizing is, is and I say this in other contexts, don't deify any faculty, don't demonize any faculty. That's right. Yes, and I think that that you could use that as a Jungian statement par excellence, right? Uh, Very much. There are no demons. Well, that, that seems like a really good place, I think, to try and draw it to a close. Okay. I, I think this was uh, extremely helpful to me, uh, and you corrected me on, on some of uh, the sloppiness of my own thinking. I thank you for that. And um, I think this will be of tremendous value if people who are interested in the meaning crisis, Jung, Jordan Peterson. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. That was fun.